Okay, right up front, I want to make something crystal clear. Neither I nor any liberals I know support wasteful spending or over-regulation by the government. Period. Except for a period in my life when I literally made more money than I could spend, I have always lived my life by living within my means, including living on the fumes of fumes like I have been lately. Shut up! <laughs> there like mentally and i say you're brain dead now name something you did every night when you were a child brush my teeth show me brush your teeth yeah. now greetings youtubers welcome to the third installment of debunking old fart rants small government stupidity video this will be extremely long um, long story short uh, I had an old camera with a built-in microphone that I was using and of course with Windows upgrades stuff becomes unusable while well, I was able to make it work for like a year and a half because I'm cheap like that well had a little snafu, and uh, I can't control the volume, so it gets incredibly loud. So long story short, I for a while in this video, I used two other old external microphones before I went and got a brand new one. I just said the heck with it. So the sound quality for some of the video, it won't be the greatest, but it's all up on my website. And the reason I went through all this in pretty much all of it in great detail is just to prove because if I go through it then I learn it a lot better and also to prove that I've disseminated more information in this one video than Dave old fart rants has on his entire channel for the entire what eight and a half years he's been vegetating on YouTube now so uh, it's all on my website if you want to go read that with all my sources and if you want to follow along on this that's fine but anyways uh, when old fart rants whines about the government or when he uh, whines about either Republicans wasting money on something or uh, a small government, you know, something, a small government project failing, whatever that, whatever that would mean. Uh, he only does it for political expediency. He doesn't realize that the government is a very inefficient machine. And he doesn't care because he's getting a lot of Medicare subsidies, so he doesn't really care. I think it might be guilt. Uh, that's why he favors a, a welfare state, but... Uh, he doesn't get into details, and his main response to this will be, it's too long. Well, he's never read anything. Sitting in front of the TV and vegetating on the couch doesn't count as research. So here you go, and if any, anybody wants to take issue with any of these 80 examples, don't sing it. Bring it. Let's begin. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This will be the third installment of completely debunking, a debunking and fisking of Old Fart Rance's small government stupidity video, and I probably did more reading for this than old Dave has done is in his entire life. So we're going to do the top 80 countdown here, 80 more examples of absolutely ridiculous and gratuitous government waste, proving once again that 99% of the people in Washington, maybe 98%, don't give a damn about the taxpayer. And this is going to be too long for... The references will be too long for YouTube, so I'm going to put a link down there on my website where I have all these references. Every single source has been uh, put in there in detail. Uh, some of them were, had to be, you know, are archived, so they're not available now, but there is an archive link to it, so you can still uh, look at them and uh, go through it. I've documented this all up, down, backwards, sideways, you name it. So this will be the top 80 countdown in reverse. Number one, Obamacare Medicaid expansion cost overruns. The 2015 Medicaid actuarial report came out last week, and with it another entry in the series of upward revisions to how much Medicaid would spend on the adults made newly eligible by the ACA's Medicaid expansion. This is something I refer to a lot, called Edwards' Budget Law, named after Chris Edwards of Cato. And the government says... A uh, government program will cost X. You can usually add 20, 30, 40, sometimes upwards of 100% to it. 
In 2015, per enrollee costs for the adults made newly eligible by the ACA's Medicaid expansion were estimated to be 49% higher than the previous projection. This is not the first upward revision. In last year's report, earlier estimates, these earlier estimates, these newly eligible adults were projected to have average benefit costs of 1% lower than adults that were already eligible. But in last year's report, this expansion population was instead estimated to be estimated to have average expenditures 19% higher. 19% higher. So per enrollee cost, previously estimated to be $4,636 in 2014, were revised up to $5,517. Even after that correction, last year's report projected that per enrollee costs would fall significantly in the second year of the expansion because they estimated that the effects of pent-up demand and adverse selection would be less of a factor. But it wasn't. In that report, actuaries estimated that per enrollee cost for this group would fall significantly from 5,571 in 2014 to 4,281 in 2015. Instead, the new report estimates estimates that per enrollee cost actually climbed to 6,366 in 2015. Good one. That was number one. Number two, I'll try to do it like they used to do the top 40 countdown uh, with Casey Kasem, those of you who remember that. Number two, a Mississippi power plant intended as a showcase for clean coal technology has turned into a costly mess for Utility Southern Company, which is now facing an investigation by the SEC, not the Southeastern Conference, but the Securities and Exchange Commission. A lawsuit from unhappy customers and a price tag that has more than doubled to $6.6 billion. A price tag that has more than doubled to $6.6 billion. The power plant, financed in part with federal subsidies, aims to take locally mined coal, convert it into a, into a flammable gas, and use it to make electricity. Conceived as a first-of-a-kind plant, it currently looks to be the last of its kind in the U.S., though China and other nations have expressed interest in the technology. Kemper costs have swelled to $6.6 billion, far above the $3 billion forecast in 2010. A former Kemper project manager said he was let go after complaining to top company officials that public estimates for the project's completion were unrealistic and misleading. Brett Wingo, who was a project manager for the gasification portion of the plant said he thinks the company put a positive spin on construction so it wouldn't have to acknowledge to investors it was likely to lose federal subsidies due to delays. To date, Southern has paid back $368 million in federal tax credits for missing deadlines but believes it will be able to keep $407 million in grants from the Energy Department, which means it came from the taxpayer. Number three... Every country wants a national airline, and every city wants a glitzy convention center to bring those free-spending conventioneers to town. But the economic analysis doesn't hold up well in either case. A new book on convention centers should be required reading for any council thinking of investing the taxpayers' hard-earned money in another white elephant. This report by Don Bader of the San Diego Reader is worth quoting at length. Would you take advice from a gaggle of consultants whose forecasts in the past two decades have been off by 50%? Of course you wouldn't. But all around the U.S., politicians, civic planners, and particularly business executives have been following the advice of self-professed experts who invariably tell clients to build a convention center or expand an existing one. A remarkable new book, Convention Center Follies, Politics, Power, and Public Investment in American Cities, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press, tells the amazing story of how one American city after another builds into a massive glut of convention center space, even though the industry itself warns its centers that the resultant price slashing will worsen current woes. The author is Haywood Sanders, the nation's ranking expert on convention centers, who warned of the billowing glut in a seminal study for the Brookings Institution back in 2005. 
In this new heavily footnoted 514 page book, Sanders, which means it's the opposite of anything Old Fart Rance does, who doesn't reference anything, Sanders, a professor of public administration at the University of Texas, San Antonio, exhaustively examines consultants' forecasts in more than 50 cities. Nashville was told its new center would result in 466,950 hotel nights, almost 467,000. It's getting around 267,000, a little better than half of what was projected. Philadelphia isn't garnering even half the business it was promised. Getting half the business that was projected is about the norm, says Sanders. The actual performance is a fraction of what it is supposed to be. What would we say about government projections? Yet in city after city, including San Diego, self-appointed civic leaders listen to and act on these faulty forecasts. In almost all cases, mainstream media and politicians swallow the predictions whole without checking the consultant's miserable tax records. Track, excuse me, track records. Maybe they should check their tax records too. How can the convention centers get away with this nonsense? Those in the know shut up. And the press, politicians, and public have neither the time nor the expertise to follow the prestidigitation. How do the consultants get away with being 50% wrong most of the time? In my opinion, not Sanders. Consultants in many fields are paid to provide answers that the people paying the consultants' bills want to hear. And the people paying those bills are the business community using taxpayer money, of course. The worst news, these expansions will keep happening as long as you have a mayor who says it is free, says Sanders. Number four, Lexington, Kentucky has received over $14 million in federal taxpayer funds to pay to finish an approximately three-mile stretch of the Town Branch Trail. The Transportation Investment Generating Economic Recovery, Tiger Grants, is offered through the U.S. Department of Transportation. This grant completes a multimodal greenway in downtown Lexington that joins two existing trail systems and integrates a region-wide network of bike and pedestrian trails, the Tiger Grant says. The $14 million in funds is, is to be used to finish the trail from South Forbes Street to Midland and Third Streets. The Lexington Herald Leader reports the grant will also be used to pay for portions of a more than two and one half mile section of the trail downtown from Oliver Lewis Way to the Isaac Murphy Memorial Art, Gar Art Garden on 3rd Street. And go ahead and dig through those Tiger Grants. It is a pork palooza. A lot of it's not post roads. But who cares? I'm sure taxpayers in Idaho and Washington State appreciate uh, that uh, work being done in Lexington, Kentucky. Number five. Over $2 million in taxpayer funds are going to developing an eastern broccoli industry through a U.S. Department of Agriculture grant. Eastern consumers' demand for local broccoli is high, but that demand cannot be met until sufficiently adaptive varieties are available and the dis distribution network is expanded. The non-technical summary for the project explains the over $2 million in funding is being given to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, because nobody in the private sector would probably throw their money at it because it uh, would be a waste. Given to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, through the National Institute of Food and Agriculture Specialty Crop Research Initiative for the developing an eastern broccoli industry through cultivar development, economically and environmentally sustainable production and delivery program. Holy moly. America's specialty crop farmers face many challenges, ranging from a chi changing climate, oh boy, to increasing production costs. Investing in cutting-edge research helps uncover solutions to keep their operations viable and ensures Americans have access to safe, affordable, and diverse food options. Then Agriculture Secretary Tom Dilsack said in a press release on the grant awards. Among the Eastern Broccoli Project objectives is to market special hybrid seeds in the U.S. that are much better adapted to the East. But, uh-oh, we, we want to get rid of GMOs, though, don't we? We don't, we don't want that stuff. 
and to overcome barriers to increased distribution of eastern grown broccoli that have not been resolved in the private sector because they're not going to make any money off it. It's going to be a loser, but who cares? If that's not, oh, well, we got a long ways to go, folks. Number six, the Labor Department's Women's Bureau on Wednesday. This is last year, though. <laughs> Or maybe even before that, who knows? I don't care. The Labor Department's <laughs> Women's Bureau on Wednesday awarded $1.1 million in grants to research and analyze how paid leave programs can be developed and implemented across the country. Since 2014, the Paid Leave Analysis Grant Program has awarded more than $3 million to 17 states and municipalities to support research on ways of implementing paid family and medical leave programs. Note, because states and municipalities are too stupid to do it for themselves. This is a harbinger of things to come, federally mandated paid leave, beyond what FMLA already does. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, only three states, California, New York, or California, New, Jer New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island, curf currently offer paid family and medical leave. New York will join them in 2018. All four state programs are funded through employee paid payroll taxes and administered through their respective disability programs. Or, or you can let employees compete for the best employers compete for the best employees by offering those benefits. I get 30 plus days of vacation a year on my job, a year on my job, and in two years I will get almost 40. My employer lures in and keeps good employees by offering this benefit, and it doesn't cost taxpayers a dime. Number seven. In today's report, Dr. Rand Paul highlights six million in taxpayer funds used to renovate Fort Belvoir's Eagle's Nest dining facility. The project was completed in November 2015, only for the facility to be permanently closed by July 1st, 2016. In addition to facing stiff competition from other local dining choices, it became clear during the renovation that the Army would likely close the Eagle's Nest. During the renovation, last November, Fort Belvoir's Eagle's Nest Dining Facility completed a $6 million renovation. And last month, less than a year later, the facility closed its doors permanently. According to the base newspaper, Belvoir Eagle, the project included installing new flooring, ceilings, lights, bathrooms, and serving lines, and replacing all the furniture with a representative of the facility, even quoted as saying, we really are a premier dining facility now. Seven months later, Fort Belvoir's website read, effective July 1st, 2016, the Fort Belvoir dining facility will be officially permanently closed. The shocking part is not that the Army is closing the facility after the renovation, but that the renovation was done in the first place. According to the Army, the facility only had less than a 5% utilization rate. I'll let you read the rest of it uh, for yourself. But uh, <laughs> last August, the Army decided to explore closing mess halls operating at less than 65% capacity based on SIK users. This meant certain closure at Fort Belvoir, Fort Belvoir where not one person is on the SIK plan. That's six million taxpayer money down the garbage disposal. Imagine the cost at the second phase of kitchen remodel had taken place. So this is how people in all areas of government, they don't give a damn about the taxpayer. That renovation should have never been done. It doesn't matter if it's the Pentagon or the Department of Agriculture, or the Department of Energy. Some departments shouldn't even exist, but uh, there's a lot of waste there. They don't care. Number eight. In today's report, Dr. Paul shines a light on the Department of Defense offering a grant opportunity of nearly 100 grand to monitor the health of the Arctic fox population on the island of Chimya. The fox is not native to the island, not endangered, and not proven to be successful at achieving the grant's stated rationale of preventing aircraft bird collisions. In fact, the Air Force considers foxes themselves to be hazards. Near the tail end of the Aleutian Islands, farther west than Hawaii, sits Shemya, a two-by-four-mile island that is home to Ericsson Air Force, Air, Ericsson Air Station, and nearly 100 grand of government waste. The Department of Defense recently published a 99,000 grant opportunity to monitor the population of the Arctic fox on Shemya. The stated rationale for this project is that the foxes appear to be de in declining health and their presence is perceived to reduce bird aircraft strike hazard. It all seems reasonable until you look 
a little deeper. Just 200 miles from Russia in the middle of the North Pacific, EAS was an important airstrip during, the World War, during World War II and the Cold War, housing both bomber and fighter groups. However, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union, of course, that utility diminished quickly and EAS was basically closed in 1995. Today, the once vibrant airfield handles about three flights a week, so it's a dead zone. And I know George Romero recently passed away, so it's not the living dead airstrip uh, style. While avoiding aircraft bird collisions is certainly an important and worthwhile goal, the use of the Arctic fox in this endeavor is not proven to be successful. You see, though, the fox will hunt seabirds. It much prefers small animals such as rodents, according to the WWF. In addition, according to the Air Force's own bird wildlife strike hazard management techniques, Foxes also present a hazard, and it recommends using pyrotechnics to frighten the species or occasionally shooting them to keep them away from airfields. But maybe there's a reason to spend almost 100 grand to save the Arctic fox. Perhaps the fox is endangered. Nope. According to the WWF, there are several hundred thousand Arctic foxes in the world earning them the status of least concern. So there's some good waste for you. Pentagon has a lot of waste. I know a lot of conservatives don't like to hear that, but. And progressives, you know, oh, yeah, 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 but when it comes to something like HUD or the Department of Energy, oh, I can't do that. Everybody wants something cut. It's just got to be someone else's crap, and that's why we're $20 trillion in the hole. Number nine, from slowly panning in when things get serious to the fast-paced pursuit of a running back breaking away, television cameras and our operators play an integral and often unsung role in our TV viewing experience. But operating a TV camera is not easy. It is a technical job that requires advanced training. Thanks to the U.S. Department of State, you are paying for some of that special planning in Estonia. State is currently advertising a 60 grand grant opportunity to train camera operators for ETV Plus, Estonian Public, Estonian Public Broadcasting's Russian-speaking channel. Interested parties are invited to submit proposals, which should include sending an American team of trainers, including a Russian English translator to Estonia to conduct training there. Separately in July or August, when the ETV production team is on leave, the grant recipient is expected to bring five camera operators to the U.S. for a 10-day training session in a learning studio. Since it is a public broadcasting channel, ETV Plus is primarily funded through Estonia's Ministry of Culture, receiving about $1.8 million to start up cash last year and having a $2.53 million budget for 2015, in which it planned to air just two hours of original programming daily. ETV, by the way, is ERR's third TV channel, so one might expect the technical expertise for camera operation to already exist within the ERR family. Yep. We've been here before, right? Number 10. Last week, the State Department announced a almost $400 U.S. taxpayer-funded grant for universities and private organizations to help the country of Morocco go green. Per Duke University, Morocco and the U.S. share a strong commitment to combating climate change, which they are tackling aggressively at the international, national, and local levels. The proposed competition will assist Morocco in breaking down barriers between government, academia, and the private sector to encourage the formulation of strong, climate-friendly public policies, foster local clean energy economies, and support Morocco's renewable energy goals. Great. Since when have American taxpayers been responsible for Morocco's renewable energy goals? Furthermore, on a global scale, the African nation's carbon emissions are relatively non-existent. Countries like the U.S., China, Russia, and India, and the EU all overwhelm all others in terms of pollution production. The United States is over, now it's $20 trillion in debt. Spending is expected to be increased by $161 billion next year, which will result in a deficit of more than a half a trillion dollars. But who cares? We've got the money. Let's just keep spending. But yes, why not ship four hundred grand to the African country of Morocco? After all, four hundred grand is only the equivalent of seven U.S. median household incomes. But of course, I'm sure no one in the U.S. could use those resources. So who cares? This should piss you off if you've gotten this far. If you're progressive, your ADD probably kicked in uh, five minutes ago at least. 
Number 11, the American Olive Producers Association has received the U.S. Department of Agriculture Specialty Crop Research Grant of 50 grand for a project that aims to develop a plan to get more SCRI grants. Last week, the USDA announced the award for the developing a transdisciplinary strategic plan for the American olive industry to identify and prioritize research opportunities and challenges project. According to the grant, the project objectives include hosting a strategic planning session facilitated by a professional consultant with experience developing successful SCRI grant projects, identifying prioritizing the research needs of the American olive industry, determining the best means to gather and share current research with the specialty crop sector, state associations, extension, professionals and growers developing a strategic plan that can be put into place immediately to generate a unified and singular approach to research and its distribution in order to benefit all the stakeholders of the American olive industry. A strategic plan that can be used as a basis for one or more future SCRI grant applications. America's specialty crop farmers face many challenges. That's just a repeat of the same crap at the start. Blah, 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 Tom Dilsack, former governor of Iowa, a, a blithering idiot and a disgrace to the human race. And you might say again, that's only 50 grand. Well, that's the mindset that's got us 20 trillion in debt. Yes, but it is low hanging fruit. So why not? Why not? Number 12, you may recall a waste report from last year called Measuring Waste Highlighting a almost 200,000 National Science Foundation, another useless agency, grant to produce a book on the history of measurement and finally answering the age-old question of why Americans do not like the metric system. If you have not made the trip to Barnes & Noble to pick up a copy, do not worry. Netflix will soon be able to satisfy your metric system cravings. Thanks to the Department of Commerce spending half a million to make a documentary on the kilogram. This is just not any kilogram, but the granddaddy of all kilos the Big K, the International Prototype Kilogram. You know Big K, the metal cylinder stored in a vault in Paris that serves as the standard for measuring mass in almost every country on Earth? That is right, taxpayers are funding, are funding a movie about the metal cylinder. Well, sort of, the movie is actually about the quest to replace the Big K with a natural constant. So I'll let you read the rest of that for yourself, but basically they wasted 500 grand on the documentary. And uh, I'm sure uh, a couple dozen people will be interested in watching it. But if viewers interested in this kind of science are a broad audience, ticket sales or sponsors should cover the cost of production, making government aid unneeded. But it wouldn't pro probably wouldn't cover it, so the government throws your money at it, even if you don't give a damn about it. If they are a narrow market, then 69 average Americans worked all year to pay for a film about a metal cylinder that only a few people will even care to watch. Complete waste of money. I, I, it'd be hard to figure out which one of these is the worst. If you forgot dollars and cents, be quite, it'd be quite a poll, quite a debate on that. Number 13, outside the D.C. area, few people have probably even heard of Wolf Trap National Park for the performing arts, let alone taken in a concert there. However, for those inside the Beltway, metaphorically speaking, Wolf Trap is a well-known venue for a variety of summer concerts. All, unfortunately, whether you've heard it, of it or not, Wolf Trap is trapping nearly 600 grand of taxpayer money for wasteful DC insider hypocrisy. Washington DC is the epicenter of pork spending. On its surface, Wolf Trap is structured to protect tax taxpayers as a kind of public-private partnership. The National Park Service maintains the park, which includes hiking trails and the like, while the nonprofit Wolf Trap Foundation is responsible for artistic programming, public relations, marketing, box office functions, and providing stage hands and certain other employees who are directly related to the presentation of performing arts. Seems like a reasonable and clear division between the National Park and its use as a venue for stage entertainment. However, the line seems to have recently been blurred as the Park Service is handing over 594 grand to the foundation to offset some of the cost of operations and productions. Do not blame the Park Service. Their hands are tied. This money comes from a 2.2 million earmark 
for the National Capital Area Performing Arts Program, which funds or subsidizes a variety of concerts and entertainment around Washington. In fact, the National Park Service has unsuccessfully asked Congress to eliminate this earmark. While Congress ignored those requests, many members may have not may not have just known the earmark was there. You see, the earmark is not in the nearly 900-page text of the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2016 or the more than 200 pages of committee reports accompanying the bill. The earmark is on page 16 of the 109-page explanatory statement for Division G of the Appropriations Act. Vague and hard to find. Almost the definition of snuck in. In the case of Wolf Trap, it gets even worse. The purpose of the funds is to pay a portion of the cost of the union stagehands that work backstage. So DC's most connected people, many of them who are strong union supporters, are using taxpayer money to alleviate themselves and fellow Washingtonians of paying union prices. The FSO committee calculates that if concert goers had to concert goers had to pay the full cast cost, excuse me of Wolf Trap concerts with unionized stagehands, ticket prices would increase by only 4%. That comes out to roughly, roughly $5 a ticket for the most expensive seats. But even if the increase were 40% or 400%, that cost should be paid by the patron who chooses to take in a show, not the taxpayer who has no choice whatsoever. Kind of reminds me of public transit uh, in faraway states that I'll never use. In case you are wondering, about 84 average Americans a year have to turn over their hard-earned money in taxes so Washingtonians can save $5 on concert tickets. By the way, Fairfax County, Virginia, where Wolf Trap is located, is the second wealthiest county in America with a median income of over 110 grand. Bordering Fairfax are the number one, Loudoun, number six, Arlington, and number eight, Montgomery County, Maryland, wealthiest counties in America. So you've got... Uh, Bordering Fairfax, you've got the top eight counties in the top eight wealthiest counties in America. So there's a whole bunch of taxpayer money for uh, union goons and a whole lot more waste. And we've got a long ways to go. Number 14, John Ioannidis. That's a tough one. Paints a picture of a vast hive of researchers all pushed to publish short papers that are mostly a waste of time. The design is bad, the results useless, even when metacolated meta with other, other badly designed studies. Basically, humankind is pouring blood, sweat, and tears into spinning wheels in medicine. Just paper churn. Most papers will, will never help a patient. Ioannidis wants rigor. Full registration before the study, full transparency afterwards, fewer studies overall, but with better design. Astonishingly, fully 85% of what is spent on clinical trials is wasted. It's really a pretty it's really a pretty big scandal, given that lives are on the line. I can't see the media or pulleys, the politicians, joining the dots. Imagine how many quality life years are being burnt at the stake of the self-feeding science PR industry. And as you'll see with when it comes to government, there's a lot of PR, a lot of pomp and circumstance. We'll get to a lot of that later in the medical field. And this is where clinical medical research, where standards are higher than in many other scientific areas and where there are easily defined terms of success like blue sky studies. Ian Onidis doesn't say it directly, but his description of the effect current funding has, which is almost all government-based, almost guarantees that researchers will be wasting time in the paper churn. Fast, short papers of little importance that may even be false, but even if true, are useless, insignificant. This is what happens when science is controlled by a government monopsony. The aim is a press release, not the patient. Science can't be done by an index formula or citation score. Money can't be spent wisely that way either. Someone needs to be responsible. How much of climate research is a waste of money? A lot more than in clinical medicine. Overall, not only are the most research findings false, but furthermore, most of the true findings are not useful. Medical interventions should and can result in a huge human benefit. 
It makes no sense to perform clinical research without ensuring clinical utility. Reform and improvement are overdue. The sheer size of the waste and the industry, 85% of a million papers. There are many millions of papers of clinical research. Approximately 1 million papers from clinical trials have been published to date, along with tens of thousands of systematic reviews, but most of them are not useful. Waste across medical research, clinical or other types, has been estimated as consuming 85% of the billions spent each year. I have previously written about why most published research is false and how to make more of it true. Clinical research remains extremely expensive, even though an estimated 90% of the present cost of trials could be safely eliminated. Reducing costs by streamlining research could do more than simply allow more research to take place. It could help make research better by reducing the pressure to cut corners, which leads to studies lacking sufficient power, precision, duration, and proper outcomes to convincingly change practice. The problem is the research funding. Current research funding incentivizes small studies of short duration that can be quickly performed and generate rapidly publishable results while answering important questions may sometimes require long-term studies whose financial needs exceed the resources of most currently available funding cycles. Utility decreases when research is not transparent. When study data, protocols, and other processes are not avail available for verification or for further use by others. Trust is also eroded when major biases occur in the design, conduct, and reporting of research. Only 61% of trials published in clinical journals in 2010 had been registered. And rates are much lower for non-regulated interventions, 21 and 29% for trials published in psychological or behavioral and physical therapy journals, respectively. Psychology's uh, largely uh, junk science anyway. Only 55 of 200, 28% of journals that publish clinical trials requ required trial registration as of 2012. Few full, full protocols are registered. Analysis plans are almost never pre-specified, and the full study data are rarely available. Focusing on major journals, some clinicians prefer to read only research published in major general medical journals in New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, BMJ, JAMA, and Plus Medicine. However, these journals cover a tiny minority of published clinical research. Out of the seven, over 730,000 articles labeled as clinical trial in PubMed as of May 26, 2016, only 18,231 were published in the major medical journals. Most of the articles that inform guidelines and clinical practice are published elsewhere. Getting free research from students, volunteers, and trainees is part of the problem, he says. Clinical research workforce and physicians. The clinical research workforce is huge. Millions of people have co-authored at least one biomedical paper and most have done so only once. Students, residents, and clinical fellows are often expected to do some research. This exposure can be interesting, but trainees are judged on their ability to, ability to rapidly produce publications, a criterion that lends itself badly to the production of short of the sort of large, long-term team performed studies often needed to inform us about health disease and health care. Such researchers can be exploited as low paid or volunteer personnel and an untrained, non-committed workforce cannot produce high quality research. Other perverse recipes in clinical research include universities and other institutions simply asking for more papers, e.g least publishable units, publishable units instead of clinically useful papers and clinical impact not being a formal part of the publication metrics so often used to judge academic performance. Instead of trying to make a prolific researcher of every physician, training physicians in understanding research methods 
and evidence-based medicine may also help improve the situation by instilling healthy skepticism and yeah, excuse me, and critical thinking skills. So it's no surprise that uh, in the medical research field, which is afloat in government money, there is a lot of waste, a lot. That's a lot of taxpayer money for no gain. Number 15, somewhere along the line, you have probably heard of early retirement buyouts where a company offers employees a sum of cash and an early retirement, often used as an alternative to layoffs. The idea is to get more senior and thus more expensive employees off the payroll and then eliminate or restructure their jobs to be less cost. A good, a good deal all around, that is unless you are a taxpayer and the EPA is offering early buyouts. According to the EPA Inspector General, in the fiscal year 2014, the EPA paid out nearly $12 million on early buyouts for roughly 500 employees. However, a sampling done by the Inspector General showed that roughly 12% of the vacated positions were not eliminated and were refilled without being rechanged. If this is a representative, representative sample of all EPA buyouts, the taxpayer would have unnecessarily spent $1.4 million. In authorizing agencies to offer early buyouts, OPM expressly says the position being vacated must either be eliminated or modified, having a different job series and or grade, using the same job series and grade, but substantively different duties and responsibilities, having a different full performance level, or a position that is no longer supervisor. It is not surprising the EPA looked to offer early buyouts to modernize their workforce and hopefully save the taxpayer in the process. The federal government is notorious for its job security, many believe, to a fault. Less than one half of 1% of federal employees were terminated for performance or laid off last year. The EPA is even worse. Only 15 employees or one-tenth of 1% 1 were terminated for performance. That is slightly more than the 13 EPA employees who died last year. They say you have to spend money to make money. Apparently, EPA, you just have to spend money. So the EPA did not follow government guidelines on uh, early buyouts, uh, getting people to retire early to get them off the payroll. And thus, they blew more than $1 million of your money. But they have a hypothetically unlimited stream of money because they can print it, the government can print it, and you know, they just keep taking it from the taxpayers or borrow it from China. This is why we're in the position we're in. Number 16. Senator Paul uncovers the NIH spending 500 grand to study people's rejection threshold for spice and bitterness. Since 2011, one researcher at Penn State has received approximately half a million dollars to study people's rejection threshold for spice and bitterness. The study found people seeking sensation like spice, but generally personality has no relation to liking spicy foods. Additionally, a similar egregious studies have been uncovered by the office of Senator Paul. One such study sought to determine what level of bitterness was objectionable for chocolate milk consumers. The result, people with a preference for dark chocolate are able to tolerate 2.3 times more bitterness than those who prefer milk chocolate. A third and also separate study explored the bitterness in the wine and how one's wine expertise predicts willingness to try new wines and foods. So... That only costs the uh, taxes of 70 average working Americans for an entire year to find out uh, why people like or dislike spice and why people like or dislike dark chocolate and wine. A waste of time. I'm just trying to inform you people so you know you're, this government is... When they preach about fiscal responsibility, they don't mean it because nobody's, there's very few people pointing this out. Number 17, followers of the Waste Report will remember the NSF's funding for a futuristic climate change video game focused on the impact of Florida communities of sea level rise. The justification for the game was that high school students were presented with the catastrophic ch climate change meter. They were not particularly motivated to act. Well, it turns out Uncle Sam wants to act. Not in Florida, but in the Philippines.
Airlines. That's right, the U.S. US aid plans to invest as much as $24.7 million as part of their Climate Ready Project to help the Philippines adopt to rising sea levels and extreme weather caused by climate change. Individual awards are limited to two million, so we'll see probably see about twelve different projects across the Philippines. So, what will these projects turn, look like? Turns out we do not know. USAID solicitation is an RFP, request for proposals for cost plus contracts. RFPs are used at all levels of government to solicit detailed plans of how to achieve stated objectives and working within established constraints. For example. If your local town wanted to build a park on an abandoned lot, an RFP might give general parameters of what kind of park, recreational or passive, and what features are desired and what are not. Kind of uh, given these parameters, what would you do? So we're spending a bunch of money trying to help the Philippines be ready for climate change. And even if the debt was at zero and we were running balanced budgets, I still wouldn't do it. American taxpayers have been shoveling money into the Philippines longer than most of you reading this or listening to this have been alive. Feel better yet? Number 18. It seems kind of circular getting federal research funding. <laughs> this is, oh, this one will get you. It seems kind of circular getting federal research funding to study the importance of federal research funding. Well, that is, that is exactly what the National Science Foundation, again, is doing, spending three hundred seventy-five grand on a two-year study to determine what effects the availability of federal funding for research has on scientists' career choices and scientific outcomes. One can only imagine what the findings will be. The grant synopsis reads in part, Young life researchers may elect to begin their careers by either entering academia or by joining biotechnology or pharmaceutical firms. Career choice is also affected by external constraints, constraints such as the availability of and competition for federal research funding. Very important. Though the Waste Report has reported on federal research shenanigans like how to have the perfect first date, etc., just how volatile is federal funding for research? This is important. We decided to look at what we found makes funding this project all the more unnecessary. Looking at federal research funding adjusted for inflation since the year 2000 for the National Science, Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and overall we found that since 2000 funding has increased 197%, 198%, 201%, 176% respectively. Further, we found that on average funding for scientific research in these areas increased again in real terms 7.23%, 7.3%, and 6.7% per year. But since historically the amount of public research funding has changed over time reflecting congressional priorities, and this project hopes to identify reforms that create more certainty in the budget allocation process, could generate greater social benefits at lower costs. We thought we might, we thought we should look back, further back even, say 50 years, to see how uncertain federal research funding might be. To find out if there was some real year-to-year -year volatility, we looked at a three and five year moving average. What we found is over 50 years funding for federal research in real terms has increased on average about 8.7% per year. And the two moving averages both hold within a half a percentage point. Similar results were found for the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, which itself saw an average increase of 13.54% and a five-year moving average of 12.33%. In other words, federal research funding does not show uncertainty. In fact, it, sh it shows stable and constant growth. And it did not take us two years and 375 grand to figure that out. Another another good one. Number 19. 
The University of California San Diego of Medicine Center for Community Health recently received a three point, almost 3.4 million grant from the USDA to increase affordable food access to participants in the food stamp program, aka SNAP. Working in conjunction with Northgate Gonzalez Market, the center will develop a program to increase the purchase of fruits and vegetables among SNAP participants by providing incentives at point of purchase at markets in Los Angeles, Orange, and San Diego counties. The UC San Diego website says the multi-year large-scale project at UC San Diego is part of the 16.8 million in grants to help SNAP under the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program announced in June. And we'll go over this later. What do people purchase with food stamps? It's a lot of garbage. There's another good waste of money. Again, I have all this at my website. You can read this at your leisure. Number 20. Number 20. This deals with how the income tax code has grown into a behemoth and the costs attached to it, whether it be government enforcement of it or helping tax filers with it, as well as the time and money tax filers waste complying with it. Washington spends a lot of time and taxpayer money, 12 billion and 90,000 employees, 90,000 employees, just on the tax code itself, aside from all the money that's stolen and wasted each year. I favor until we repeal the 16th Amendment, a flat income tax void of all these deductions, we can have a carve out until say 20,000 and everyone files as a singular single filer, no more marriage in the tax code. A flat income tax to avoid of all these deductions for 401k contributions, HSAs, and whatnot. Once we find enough intelligent people in Congress to begin repealing the 16th Amendment, we can cut down on Washington's ability to redistribute income and tax consumption at a flat rate. Beans, bullets, burritos, beer, and broccoli will be treated the same. Just as your income stream, whether it be escort services or brain surgery, should be treated the same, what you purchase also will be. So there's a lot of waste there of just enforcing this gargantuan, cumbersome tax code. Number 21. If there is anything superheroes are known for, it is fighting crime. But could a superhero cartoon be used as a tool? to deter terrorists in the real world? Well, Uncle Sam seems to think so and is spending taxpayer money on such an effort in Pakistan. That is right, the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, which is part of the Department of State, is currently advertising a 1.25 million grant opportunity to produce a superhero cartoon in Pakistan. INL is asking for 292 minutes of animation to be created over two 13-episode seasons, which comes out to $4,280 a minute from American taxpayers. Sounds like our government government is again playing the villain in the story of fiscal responsibility. So yeah, $1.25 million to produce a superhero cartoon in Pakistan. What a waste. Number 22. 9.7 million in federal funds are going to a new program to improve the parenting skills of fathers in Indiana. The Columbus Republic reports that providing opportunities for parental success program, POPS, has received the funding through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The POPS program is aimed at identifying barriers that prevent fathers from being involved in their children's lives and finding ways to overcome them. The new program will be targeting this is government paternalism at its best. The new program will be targeting biological fathers, stepfathers, and expectant fathers in six counties in Indiana. The goal of the POPs program is to help fathers to become better parents, partners, and providers, and to create healthier environments for their children. Centerstone, which provides mental health and addiction services in the area, operates the POPs program. Isn't it funny that back in the 1950s, none of this crap existed, or the 40s, and families were more intact? Times they are changing. Bob Dylan was right. Here are some barriers to fatherhood. How about instead of a three-day courtship, which results in a shotgun marriage or not, because somebody's pregnant, how about a four- or five-year courtship? 
Here's a novel idea. Actually procure a job paying above the minimum wage prior to having children. Maybe have just one child. Finish high school completely and have your quote-unquote dream job, or the closest thing, for three years before reproducing. Just novel ideas that folks who have an IQ above room temperature come up with. Yeah, our government, which murders people with drones, even American citizens sans trial or congressional consent, puts millions of blacks, white, and Hispanic folks in jail for victimless, cl victimless crimes, war on drugs, and has balanced the budget a grand total of three times since the 1950s, where 20 trillion in the hole, wants to teach you how to be a better father. Pardon me, but don't take them seriously. Number 23, the USDA has announced that it is paying $8.8 million of taxpayer funds to boost production of biofuels and sustain jobs at renewable energy facilities. Advanced biofuels expand America's energy options and increase our sources of homegrown renewable energy. Then Secretary of the USDA Tom Vilsack said, These payments not only help spur biofuel production, but also protect the environment and help create jobs by building a renewable energy economy in rural areas. If creating jobs is all you're worried about, Tom, then why not just hire every unemployed person to work in the renewable energy sector tomorrow? We'll just rob Peter to pay Paul to work in an industry no private sector actor wants to risk his own money on, so we'll risk taxpayer dollars. Nonsense. Just pay them to dig another Hoover Dam with shovels and teaspoons. That'll create jobs for decades. Number 24. Airports in Missoula and Billings, Montana receive word they'll receive 600 grand and 750 grand respectively in federal government money to court nonstop air service to and from Texas. Billings and Missoula are two of nine small communities which, you know, I'd say more people go through LaGuardia in the next hour than they'll go through both of those and combined in two weeks. Billings and Missoula are two of nine small communities to receive $5.15 million in grants from the Small Community Air Service Development Program. U.S. Transportation, then U.S. Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox announced in a press release. Missoula's 600 grant goes towards a revenue guarantee to assure an airline won't lose money by coming to town. So in other words, we're just throwing uh, money out the window. <laughs> On, uh, you know, because no offense to my friends in Montana, but you know, Missoula is not exactly the, a hot spot. It will also be used for marketing and fee waivers. In other words, the people that use the airlines aren't paying for it. The Billings grant of 750 grand will be used for a revenue guarantee and marketing program for American Airlines for nonstop service to Dallas Fort, Fort Worth because American Airlines wouldn't go there without the subsidy. The airline won't lose money, but the taxpayers will. This reminds me of Amtrak making trips to Jerkwater, Montana. No offense, no offense to my friends in Montana. It's not a money maker. Sorry. We should subsidize Walmart super centers in towns of about 1,000, so those folks don't have to travel 20 or 30 miles to get groceries. So unfair. More federal dollars going to airports. Chuck Schumer and Kristen Gillibrand recently announced over one million in taxpayer money from the. USDOT will be used to design and reconstruct 800 feet of existing taxiway pavement for the Greater Rochester International Airport. And then there was a, let's see, a, oh, the latest over $1 million investment follows similar recent federal investments announced by Schumer and Gillibrand, including over $2.9 million to undertake taxiway improvements and a service road relocation project project, as well as $1.9 million grant to fund a new de-icing facility at the airport. And I'm sure the people in uh, Montana that don't use that airport appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure taxpayers in Idaho, Michigan, Washington State, New Mexico appreciate this runway that's getting fixed. It's right there in Article 1, Section 8. Congress shall make every square inch of airport runway safe. I have an idea. Let folks use that airport pay for the repairs, right? Or am I selfish if I say that? Does Home Depot or Walmart fleece the taxpayers to fix their parking lots? Post roads are Congress's domain, not airport runways. So the waste just keeps on piling on. The East-West Center, as it is known, was created by Congress in 1962. Better relations and understanding among the people and nations of the U.S. 
Asia and the Pacific. Of course, in 1960, Hawaii had just become a state. <clears throat> the U.S. was on the cusp of its third war in the Pacific since 1941. We weren't even talking to mainland China. No one had the internet, and international travel was rare. No one drove a Kia or wore Nikes, which have always been produced in Asia. And Ninja Warrior wasn't even a thing. In the last five decades, it's safe to say things have changed a little. So what does fostering understanding on your dime look like? Well, in addition to conferences and events, the EDO East-West Center funds research fellowships and scholarships with substantial funding towards education and living expenses, including tuition and fees, graduate residence, hall room costs, health insurance, book allowance, and a partial living stipend. This year, they are also putting a on a 12-day U.S. presidential election reporting seminar, it's last year actually, with aim to enable participating journalists to report before, during, and after the U.S. presidential election from key states in the American electoral system. Of course, they will have to put what they learned to use in 2020 as a seminar conflicts with the actual election this year. What is most amazing about the East-West Center is that in the fiscal 2010, fiscal year 2010 budget, President Oboingo, whose mother actually was actually an East-West Center student while she was growing up, tried to cut the center's funding in half, arguing that this would encourage the center to seek other sources for money. Instead, then Senate Appropriations Committee Chairman Dan Inoue from Hawaii increased funding to his home state project by two million. Shocking! Can you believe he took two million more? from taxpayers in 49 other states. Year after year, including this year, the president's budget unsuccessfully proposes the same thing, roughly cutting funding in half for the center. At least in this instance, congressional pork is mightier than even the president, and in most cases it is, unfortunately. Number 26, that was number 25, this is number 26. The USDA program that awarded almost 250 grand to help develop a develop a pecan snack last year is soliciting applications for awards of 44 million in grant money through July 1st. The money is being offered through the Value Added Producer Grant Program. The USDA list of 20, 2015 grant awards under the VAPG program includes 247,000 and then some to Front Porch Pecans LLC of Georgia to help develop a pecan snack. So, yes, we got to spend we got to spend taxpayer money because if we don't develop a pecan snack, uh, I think the world might come to an end. And then there's uh, here's more USDA waste. What farm bills have wrought. And this just uh, talks about uh, some of the perverse incentives related to egg subsidies. Sugar's a really bad one. This is about peanuts. Most Americans don't give a second thought of the cost of a bag of peanuts, except when they cost way too much at the ballpark. However, Americans will collectively spend an estimated $2 billion on peanuts this year before even breaking open, breaking open a shell. This $2 billion will come courtesy of the Agricultural Act of 2014. I've got the roll call votes there. No more broadly as the Farm Bill. It turns out politicians have forced American taxpayers to subsidize peanut farmers with our hard-earned tax dollars. This is a blatant example of corporate welfare. Note, corporate cronyism to the max. Here's how it works. The Farm Bill provides taxpayer subsidies to farmers if crop prices fall below a government-mandated level, which is what's happening right now. For the third consecutive year in a row, overproduction of peanuts has caused their prices to fall below that threshold. The projection for this year's harvest is 6.1 billion pounds leaving an extra 2.9 billion pounds of excess of market demand. Theoretically, bar owners of peanut aficionados and PB&J sandwich makers across the country should be glad about all this extra supply, but the government won't let them enjoy too much of a, of a good thing. We still have to foot the bill for the government subsidy payroll that goes directly to peanut producers. These subsidies make up the difference between what individuals are willing to pay for peanuts and what the government thinks people should pay for peanuts. $535 per ton. In other words, it's not a free market. In other words, the cheaper peanuts are, the more taxpayers shell out. This senseless federal agricultural policy is yet another failed government program 
That's a relic of a bygone era, in this case, the New Deal. Then America's agricultural sector was experiencing deflation or lower prices than normal in an attempt to curry favor with farmers. Surprisingly, the government made efforts to raise prices on the goods they produced. And uh, Hoover, Herbert Hoover did the same thing. During his presidency, he tried to keep prices and wages high. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing how he was a liberal. A lot like anti-free marketeer, but you don't see that in the textbooks. To, the, to do that, they had to reduce the abundance of those goods. The federal government's bright eye solution, it cuts checks to farmers and required them to literally burn crops and slaughter hogs at a time when millions of Americans couldn't afford to eat. That's government intelligence for you. That's why we have with the USDA is a boon to somebody. Number 27. Then Secretary of Agriculture Tom Dilsack announced Thursday six universities have been awarded nearly $3.8 million in funding by the USDA for programs to help fight obesity. 746000 to the University of Kentucky. For the testing of uh, the program Smart Shopping. According to the program description, Smart Shopping is aimed at providing the shopping practices of adolescents with the ultimate goal of increasing fruit and vegetable intake. Because if you keep ramming this down everybody's throats, I mean, they'll do it. Here's another one. Um, among many, an obesity program at the University of Montana has received... Uh, 150 grand in funding to design and test the viability of an intervention to improve healthy eating among children in the Flathead Indian Reservation. Taxpayer money well spent because apparently the parents in the Flathead Indian Reservation are too stupid to uh, teach their kids. Maybe their kid, maybe they're stupid. Yeah, they're stupid. Their kids are stupid. Well, that's that's the only logical conclusion if the government's got to be there to hold their hand. Number 28. U.S. DOT recently announced the opening of the two-mile Kansas City streetcar line, which allows passengers a free ride downtown. Free! The department helped fund the streetcar project with approximately $37 million in federal taxpayer dollars. The department is proud to partner with Kansas City on its new streetcar, which will provide important connection to jobs, community services, and other opportunities for residents, said the U.S then U.S. Transportation Stooge Anthony Fox. KC Streetcar website informs travelers the streetcar is free to ride, according to the U.S. DOT release. The department helped fund the project with $20 million from a transportation uh, DOT Tiger Grant, which we talked about earlier, and approximately $17 million in other DOT funds. Free money, because it'll, it'll connect people to jobs. Of course, the money they stole for this stupid free streetcar from taxpayers in 49 other states. That could have been in the uh, pocket of an entrepreneur and could have been better spent. I mean, heck, you just go down Main Street and bust out all the windows. and Tiger Grants could fix all the windows on Main Street. It's, it's the same crap. It doesn't create wealth. It just moves it around. Number 29. I've already disseminated more information in this video than Old Fart Rants has in all of his combined. Seriously. I've also probably brushed my teeth more times in the last week than he has in his whole life, but that's neither here nor there. Number 29, the USDA, or excuse me, the FDA, has just launched an anti-tobacco campaign focused on young adults who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. New campaign, This Free Life. Cost $35.7 million. It was collected from the tobacco industry. That money could have gone to something better. I understand that's not exactly a subsidy since the tobacco com companies lost in court or the, gave it to the government and it was given to the government. Um, not a very wise use of the money, though. I mean, been warning labels on cigarettes to the, since the 60s. These idiots have parents. It's not the government's job to stop tobacco consumption any more than it's the government's job to teach the birds and the bees. That's the job of the parents, and I, for one, would appreciate it if you would take your job as a parent more seriously. There are too many retards in Washington who reward irresponsibility. So if you have, have a penis, and you decide to be emasculated, wear a dress, take estrogen, look like the offspring of Alina Kagan and Rachel Mandow, knock yourself out. 
If you want to smoke cigarettes, cannabis, crack, drink copious amounts of alcohol, knock yourself out. If you want to have multiple sex partners in one night, engage in unprotected anal sex, share needles, knock yourself out. I am not your mother, nor would I want to be. You have the freedom to destroy yourself, and I will not take that away from you. I have my own life to manage. I have enough on my plate. However, if you were born a male, you have a penis, you do not have the right to go in my niece's dressing room or bathroom. You will face a reprisal for that. As far as the other items I listed above, as long as all... As long as all your partners are adults and you're not driving out, driving a motor vehicle out of your mind on drugs, I don't care. I would advise against that, but again, I'm not your mother. If you smoke cigarettes for 30 plus years and get cancer, don't act surprised and don't come crying to me. If you get HIV, AIDS, or some other STD from your sinful sexual proclivities, do not come crying to me about it. And do not expect any financial assistance. You're an idiot. And you'll get what you deserve. If you drink like a fish, don't be surprised when your liver is useless. Personal responsibility, folks. America has forgot it. Number 30. The Department of the Interior has awarded a contract for a 10-foot inflatable walk-around Smokey Bear costume for $5,000. The $5,000 price is $919 higher than it would have cost to purchase a trademark. 10-foot air inflated to walk around Smokey Bear from the only company licensed to make it. According to the Federal Business Opportunities website, the contract was awarded on May 3, 2016 to DMV Construction Services, LLC of Exeter, Pennsylvania, under the Indian Small Business Economic Enterprise set-aside designation. I bet you didn't even know that existed. Contracts marked with that designation are solicited only from Indian Economic Enterprises. Number 31, in the latest edition of Waste Report, the Department of State spending is spending $1 million in taxpayer money to produce 12 episodes of a variety show in, Af in Afghanistan. The Department of State claims the main purpose will be to teach English. However, the variety show will still be primarily written and performed using Dari, Afghanistan's primary languages. So enough of that. <laughs> and a variety show in Afghanistan. One million dollars. Money well spent. Waste. But they don't care. If you want to fund that variety show, go ahead and spend some of your own damn money. Number 32. In the latest edition of the Waste Report, Senator Paul uncovers National Science Foundation spending 70 grand taxpayer dollars to fund a New York University study investing, investigating the gender gap among contributors, contributors excuse me, to the free online encyclopedia, a.k.a. A, a, a toilet, Wikipedia. Have a question? Often Wikipedia has an answer. But if your question is, why is the federal government spending 70, 70 grand to study gender disparity among Wikipedia contributors? You might get back results not found if you mean government waste. That's right, the NSF spent 70 grand funding a New York U University study to investigate the gender gap among contributors to Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a giant toilet anyway. Number 33. How many federal agencies, at least 13, does it take to conduct climate research? Of course, much of this is redundant. Too many cooks spoil the broth, but who cares? Washington doesn't because they have a hypothetically endless supply of taxpayer payer dollars, and they can always print more, of course. It takes a lot of taxpayer money and a lot of brainwashing to convince everyone the science is settled. We autistically hear that repeated. The science is settled. Well, yeah. Even with all that propaganda, the science is not settled. Number 34, the GAO, 
Government Accountability Office, Comptroller General, testified at a House Oversight and Government Reform Committee hearing Wednesday that the federal government can save over $1 billion over a few, few years if it closes a loophole that allows people who receive disability benefits to also receive unemployment benefits at the same time. So uh, this was uh, at that uh, committee meeting. Uh, John Duncan, Republican Tennessee, said, You mentioned potentially saving billions on Social Security disability payments. Will you tell us about what needs to be done in that area? And uh, Comptroller General Gene Dodaro said, Yes, right now people can receive full disability benefits and unemployment benefits at the same time. Dodaro testified at a hearing on government waste and inefficiency, explained that if someone is on disability, they can receive permission to try to work because obviously we want them to go to work. However, he said, if they take a job and then they're eventually laid off in that position, they can collect both benefits. We don't think, think that this is a prudent use of federal government's money to get both full disability benefits and unemployment benefits at the same time. He said, I believe they could save $1.3 billion over a few years if that change is made. But you, if you say that, you point that out, oh, you probably hate people who aren't paying for this. You're selfish. Telling me who is paying for it. You're selfish if you don't want to pay for that. Especially if they're on disability for a, a, a mood disorder. Yeah, a lot, of that, a lot of that going around. A lot of mood disorder going around. Take a look, number 35. Take a look at the new Rural Development Progress Report from the USDA. Rural programs are just $6 billion out of the $150 billion USDA budget, which in turn is just a small sliver of the $4 trillion federal budget. Yet this relatively small USDA division has its subsidy tentacles into everything. As the following giveaways from the 2015 Progress Report show, I'm just going to read off a few. $5.2 million. I remember this is USDA. $5.2 million for a fire station in Sweetwater County, Wyoming. $2 million for a vet clinic in North Dakota. Uh, <laughs> 7500 $7, to some guy in Red Bluff, California to fix his water well. How about uh, a pavement? How about my driveway getting paved? Just, you know, for the heck of it. $7.5 million to fix a dam in Idaho. The tone of the progress report is triumphant and self congratulatory Congratulatory. This has been a year of historical accomplishment for the USDA. The agency's broadband investments have been extremely successful and offer the potential for exponential rural growth in the future. Exponential. Wow. The thinking seems to be that the federal government has a magical source of money, so federal aid is an automatic boost to society. Of course, all federal aid money ultimately comes from the taxpayers who live in the 50 states. So activities such as the USDA rural are a zero-sum game. Actually, they are worse than zero-sum game because taxpayers have to pay for all the bureaucratic middlemen who run these money recycling schemes. Who knew the USDA was a subsidiary of HUD? This is Soviet-style central planning, folks. Number 36. Federal government has spent nearly $3 million on a web-based intervention study that aims to have young adults increase their intake of fruits and vegetables. How many times have we seen this? The five-year menu, making effective nutritional choices. Gen Y study has received over $2.8 million in taxpayer money since 2012. The goal of the effort is to increase daily intake of fruits and vegetables for young adults born in or after 1980, known as Generation Y. According to the project description on the National Institutes of Health website. So, But yet, everybody, kids are still fat. The, the idiot, these idiot parents are still raising fat kids. So, what good has it done? I don't have any fat kids, so why am I paying for someone else's fat, stupid kids? In the latest edition of Waste Report, uh, this is the Southern Arizona Veterans Affairs Healthcare System knowingly allowing 217,000 taxpayer dollars worth of medical medical equipment to sit idle for over four months, preventing veterans from getting the medical care they deserve and need. You might have heard some of the new terms lately, things like supply chain, just-in-time inventory, Lean Six Sigma, and even some old words like efficiency and logistics have gotten new pep. 
It is all part of a collective realization in business that letting supplies sit idle is wasteful. Even the best tools and products do no good if they are misused or allowed to sit. Unfortunately, the Veterans Health Administration seems to have missed this trend and allowed 360 pieces of medical equipment to sit all idle for months, costing taxpayers 217 grand. According to the Veterans, the VA Office of the Inspector General, the Southern Arizona VA Healthcare System took delivery of 1.8 released urology equipment in October 2014 and then let it sit for idle for nearly half a year. So I'll let you read the rest of that for yourself. But who cares because, you know, dang it, we got an endless supply of taxpayer money and that's number 37. Number 38, documentaries often give us insight into some subject with which we were previously not familiar. What you might also not be familiar with is how last year Uncle Sam spent over two million of your tax money to send filmmakers around the world showing their documentaries in the name of diplomacy. The American Film Showcase, a partnership between the University of Southern California and the U.S. Department of State highlights the value of film in fostering understanding and cooperation, dialogue, and debate. So, basically, the U.S. sent... Uh, bunch of clowns around the world and spent a bunch of your money sent filmmakers to 73 countries reaching roughly 25,000 people worldwide according to the program's fitter so spent money sending idiots around the world to uh, showcase American filmmaking so uh, this US over that time the US taxpayer is paying just over 200 person reached by the film so yeah another good uh, Good job, Washington. Number 39, remember those new no boots on the ground declarations from Oboingo? This is last year, of course. Well, now John Kerry is whining that Congress hasn't been willing to vote to do that. What? I thought there weren't going to be any boots on the ground. Of course, yours truly told you the day the U.S. got involved in Syria that there would be boots on the ground. In addition, no vote was ever taken by Congress to get our military involved in Syria in the first place, whether it be training moderate rebels or bombing ISIS. The Oboingo administration has declared repeatedly that there will be no U.S. boots on the ground in Syria, but on Sunday, Secretary of State John francois Kerry criticized Congress for showing absolutely zero willingness to vote for troops to be deployed. Defending the administration's response to the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria in the light in light of a spate of mass casualty terror attacks around the world. Uh, Duns Kerry said on CNN's State of the Nation that the terrorist group was on the run in Iraq and in Syria. Heard that during the Bush administration, didn't they? Same declarations. When asked whether the U.S. could be doing more to put pressure on ISIS, however, Kerry faulted Congress for not being more supportive of a stronger military response. A lot of people have talked about American troops going in, etc. He said Congress has displayed absolutely zero willingness to vote to do that. And if people have a willingness to show that now that has changed, the administration will listen to any legitimate plan, any legitimate way to do more, because he's an interventionist, just like Bush. The implication in the comments was that the administration has been eager to send in U.S. troops, only to be stymied by that dang Congress. But they, they still did it anyway. In the absence of a new war declaration or authorization for the use of military force, the administration has been relying on a post-9-11 AUMF, something which officials since the start of the airstrike campaign against ISIS in 2014 made clear the administration believes provides statutory, uh, statutory authority. For its part, the administration has stressed repeatedly that there will not be boots on the ground in Syria and Iraq, even as the actual number of troops on the ground is swollen to around 4,600 in Iraq at the time and 300 in Syria. The administration officials maintain that those deployed troops do not constitute boats on the ground in the conventional sense. <laughs> sure, they're not carrying machine guns either. Since they are not there as part of a combat mission, but by, rather than trained, so they're not carrying any weapons, of course. Advise and assist local forces as they confront the ISIS jihadists. 
And then we have this tied in with it. U.S. tax dollars are going to relief agencies in Syria that are engaging in bid rigging and multiple bribery and kickback schemes, and the federal government has taken inadequate steps to prevent it, according to a recent audit. The fraud makes an already difficult task even tougher in getting needed aid to Syrians in a country besieged by civil war and attacks by ISIS, according to a GAO report released last week. Lack of oversight by the State Department and USAID is worse than that in other war zones, the report says. USAID officials noted, for instance, that unlike humanitarian responses conducted in other countries, including those in conflict situations like Afghanistan or Iraq, USAID staff are unable to visit project sites in Syria and speak with program beneficiaries. USAID officials also acknowledge that several gaps in their monitoring system due to remote management, such as verifying progress, obtaining comprehensive monitoring data on individual activities, and assessing the quality of monitoring data reported to USAID. Since 2015, there have been 116 co uh, complaints about alleged abuse of USAID funds in Syria. The most common fraud against USAID involves collusion between vendors and implementers, procurement involving bribes or kickbacks in exchange for contract steering. USAID Inspector General Calvaresi Barr told the House Foreign Affairs Middle East and North Africa Subcommittee. The Office of Inspector General's investigations prompted USAID action that has resulted in more than 11 million, 11 and a half million in savings, six program suspensions, the removal of 10 employees of USAID implementers, and suspension or debarment actions against 15 individuals or companies involved in collusive bidding schemes, Barr told the panel on July 14th, last year or before that. One investigation found a Turkish, Turkish vendor paid by USAID delivered food ration kits with salt substituted for lentils. If the contract had not been canceled and the fraud had not been identified, the financial loss would have surpassed 106000 for taxpayers, according to the Inspector General. Basically, uh, excuse me, basically there's a whole lot of uh, fraud, waste, and abuse going on in Syria. There was uh, another investigation of fabricated documentation claim and an in uh, the internal watchdogs discovery saved the taxpayers ten and a half million. But there's still been a lot lost. In other words, we shouldn't be in Syria. We haven't declared war upon them, and uh, we should be out of there. But we're going to lose a lot of money there, as we did in Afghanistan. The deeper we get involved, the more money the taxpayer is going to lose. USAID is always at least an honorable mention when it comes to government agencies flushing taxpayer dollars down the toilet. Okay, what we're going to go over now is uh, various tax credits and their high improper payment rates. Uh, the speech I have at my website is much different than what I'm going to do now because I think this dovetails better uh, with the screenshots. Um, so some highlights of all these. Uh, earned income tax credit is the main one, but we're going to cover some other ones. The IRS's fiscal year 2012 improper payment report to... Uh, this is a Treasury uh, Inspector General 2012 improper payment report. The TIGTA indicates that EIT payments totaled nearly $62 billion. The IRS estimated that 21 to 25 percent of the EIT pay EITC payments made in fiscal year 2012 were an error. That is a huge amount. 21 to 25 percent. If any business had that error rate, they would not be in business anymore. The IRS is still not in compliance with the requirements of Executive Order 13520. The IRS has not established annual improper payment reduction targets as required. The IRS cited the complexity. Get this, this is important. The IRS cited the complexity of the EITC program as well as the need to balance the reduction in improper payments while still encouraging individuals to use the credit as the two main reasons why reduction targets have not been established. And this is just, it's the same crap every year. We need to streamline the tax code. We need to simplify the tax code. Washington redistributing income 
is not working. What we need to do is just lower taxes on poor people instead of giving all, trying to give all this money back. And again, here's uh, if the IRS is saying the tax code is complex, what's a regular guy to do? So why not simplify the tax code over that thwart Bernie Sanders' efforts to redistribute income? And now we've got April 27, 2016, billions of dollars in unidentified, potentially erroneous earned income tax credit claims. It's still going on. The IRS estimates that 23.8%, that's 15.6 billion of EITC payments were issued improperly in fiscal year 2015. That's an incredibly high error rate. TIGTA estimates that, that the potential additional child tax credit on top of the child tax credit that people already get, TIGTA estimates that the potential additional child tax credit improper payment rate for fiscal year 2015 is 24.2% .2 with potential improper payments totaling $5.7 billion. It estimates that the potential American Opportunity Tax Credit improper payment rate for fiscal year 25, 2015 is 30.7%. Now it's only 1.8 billion, but you can see it's the it's the error rate that's important. 30.7%. Ridiculous. Here's February 2011, improper earned income tax credits again. The IRS continues to report that 23% to 28% of EITC payments are issued improperly each year. In fiscal year 2009, this equated to 11 billion to 13 billion in EITC improper payments. 23 to 28 percent. Still high. Here's something for the, the Boingo Recovery Act. Noticing a trend, tax credits are largely a vote buying scheme and result in a lot of ta lost taxpayer dollars. Individuals receive millions of dollars in erroneous plug-in electric and alternative motor vehicle credits. This is January 21st, 2010. Individuals claim more than 163.9 million in plug-in electric and alternative motor vehicle credits from January 1st through July 24th, 2010. What TIG to found? 12,920 individuals who electronically filed their tax returns and erroneously claimed $33 million in plug-in electric and alternative motor vehicle credits. That comes from the taxpayer, people who actually pay taxes. In addition, 1,719 of the 12,920 individuals also erroneously reduced the amount of the alternative minimum tax owed by almost $5.3 million. Let's simplify the tax code. The IRS has already said it's complex. And these are the idiots that uh, are the, they're the tax police. These actions have resulted in an estimated 3.1 million in revenue protected. The erroneous claims tick to identify it resulted from inadequate IRS processes to ensure information reported by individuals claiming plug-in electric and alternative motor vehicle credits met qualifying requir requirements or vehicle year placed in service date and make and model. TIGTA found that the IRS is unable to track and account for plug-in electric and alternative motor vehicle credits claimed by individuals on paper filed tax returns. So <laughs> they're just saying, hey, how about some fraud? Our review of electronically filed tax returns also identified individuals who erroneously claimed the same vehicle for multiple plug-in electric and alternative motor vehicle credits or claimed an excessive number of vehicles for personal use credits. TIGTA also identified improper claims for the credits by prisoners and IRS employees. So the solution is not more tax credits. The solution is streamlining the tax code. And here we've got uh, fiscal outlook addressing improper payments and the tax gap would improve the government's fiscal position. We're I'm going to focus on improper payments for this part. YGAO did this study. The federal government continues to face an unsustainable long-term fiscal path. How many years have we been hearing this? Changing this path will require difficult fiscal policy decisions like cutting Social Security benefits, which is being done already. 
changing this path will require difficult fiscal policy decisions to alter both long-term federal spending and revenue. In the near term, executive branch agencies and Congress can take action to improve the government's fiscal position by addressing two long-standing issues, improper payments and the tax gap. Over time, these issues involve amounts near or exceeding $1 trillion. Just real quick on the tax gap, uh, the poor, rich, and middle class all avoid taxes. It's no secret. People in the construction industry avoid taxes. They work for cash under the table a lot. I'm not just picking on them. That's one example I know of that's prevalent. And they have a cover job, but they're not. It's not just the rich, but here's what GAO found. The improper payment estimate attributable, attributable to 124 programs across 22 agencies in fiscal year 2014 was $124.7 billion up from 105.8 billion in fiscal year 2013. The almost 19 billion increase was primarily due to the Medicare, Medicaid, and Earned Income Tax Credit programs, which account for over 75% of the government-wide improper payment estimate. For fiscal year 2014, federal entities reported estimated error rates for 10 risk-susceptible programs that exceeded 10%. For fiscal year 2014, two federal agencies did not report improper payment estimates for four risk susceptible programs and five programs with improper payment estimates greater than $1 billion were non-compliant with federal requirements for three consecutive years. But don't worry about it. The taxpayer will cover this. We've got uh, GAO has stated that continued agency attention is needed to identify susceptible programs, develop reliable estimation methodologies, report as required, and for implement effective corrective actions based on root cause analysis. Absent, absent such continued efforts, federal government cannot be assured the taxpayer funds are adequately safe guarded. How about shrink the size of government? Was that uh, ever part of the deal or what? I guess not. Here we go back all the way back to 1995. So far back, Old Fart Rance was, well, he was old. He was old back then. Yeah, and he's old now. Way back in 1995, the EITC was enacted in 1975, but Estimates using the data from the IRS's Taxpayer Compliance Measurement Program suggest that in 1988, 32% of EITC claimants were ineligible for the credit. 34% of the credit amount claimed that year was claimed inappropriately. This measure includes excess amounts claimed by individuals and tied to the credit, as well as the entire amounts claimed by individuals who are not entitled to the credit. Data from earlier TCMP audits were roughly similar. Data from the 1985 TCMP suggests that 38% of the EITC claimants were ineligible for the credit and 37% of the credit amount was claimed inappropriately. While data from the 1982 TCMP suggests that 27% of the EITC claimants were ineligible for the credit and 29% of the credit amount was claimed inappropriately. So how many time, how, many, how long is this going to go on before... We just make me make a carve out for the first, I proposed a 0% tax rate, everybody with no deductions for ESAs, HSA, HSAs, 401k, uh, get rid of all this tax credit crap and have like a carve out for the first, oh, 17,520,000 5, 17, of income, 0%, everybody files as a tax, a uh, single filer, and then after that, it's a flat 10% amount, but no deductions for charity. I would get rid of nonprofit status as well. I know that we'll go over like a turd in the punch bowl because people like it when the government redistributes income and rewards people for giving to good causes. Give to the good cause without a damn uh, rebate come April. It's ridiculous. The EITC is a huge program. In 2015, it will provide an estimated $69 billion in benefits to 28 million recipients. The EITC is the largest federal tra cash transfer program for low-income households. Benefits are available to households with earnings from employment. While the EITC is administered through the tax code, it is primarily a spending program. 
the EITC is refundable, meaning that individuals who pay no income taxes, which is about 45% of all tax filers now, are nonetheless eligible to receive a payment from the U.S. Treasury. Of the $69 billion in benefits this year, about 88% or $60 billion is spending. So we're paying people to exist. Rather than streamlining and flattening the tax code where Washington redistributes income because that's what Washington wants to do and that's what Washington does. Number 41, Hussein Obama's expanded food stamp program certifying flea market retailers as vendors to provide low-income neighborhoods with fresh produce has ripped open a Pandora's box of fraud and corruption. Of course, you remember they had to go to the swipe cards because there was so much fraud and corruption in it, as opposed to what it was back in the old days. You'll have to ask Old Fart Rants about that. This week, federal authorities in South Florida busted the largest food stamp fraud operation in U.S. history. 22 defendants in the largely black and Hispanic areas of Miami-Dade County known as Opa, Loca, and Hialeah swindled the government i.e. the taxpayers, out of $13 million by fraudulently trading food stamps for cash. The crooked vendors operated food and produce stands at a local free mar flea market as part of the First Lady Hussein, Michelle Hussein Oboingo's initiative to eradicate food deserts. Common and poor minority communities where fresh, healthy food is tough to find or often unavailable. It's, they don't want to eat it. Just... You can put up all the fruit stands you want, and <laughs> most of the time, people aren't going to eat it. <laughs> Just the, America's full of a lot of fat, lazy people. The feds say the business owners and their employees let food stamp recipients use their welfare benefit to get cash in exchange for a cut of the money. They swipe the recipient's SNAP card. The government created the name to avoid stigma from food stamps for an inflated amount, doled out cash, and kept a percentage. So all it did, if you want to read more, go to my website on it. But if you, uh, all they did was cost uh, taxpayers $13 million. Food stamps, uh, we'll get to this, it should be left to the states. Got improper payments, number 42, got welfare and food stamp fraud. Taxpayers are another casualty of the vaunted war on poverty. The Maine Department of Health and Human Services announced on Monday that it expects to surpass last year's record number of uncovered welfare fraud. WCSH reports the Fraud Investigation and Recovery Unit brought a total of 105 cases to the Attorney General for prosecution last year, totaling more than... 1.2 million in stolen state benefits. So far this year, the unit has brought 29 cases for prosecution, totaling over $456,000 just in Maine alone in theft of state benefits. Roth said that cases where a person uses a dead relative's EBT card are becoming more common. He said one of the big red flags is that a card may be being used inappropriately is out-of-state purchases. Between 2011 and 2015, more than $64 million in EBT money doled out in Maine was spent out of state. New Hampshire led the way with more than $43 million. Number 43, Massachusetts State Auditor Suzanne M. Bump has released an annual report for Office's Bureau of Special Investigations, which identified a record 13.7 million in public assistance benefits fraud in fiscal year 2015. The 13.7 million represents a 44% increase over the previous year's record of 9.5 million and is the fifth straight year of record setting findings, according to the report. According to the report, the majority of the fraud identified was in the mass health over almost 7.8 million, over 7.7 million, and the SNAP program well over four and a half million there. So plenty of fraud there uh, among people who aren't rich, as I said. Number 44, in this case, fraud and the usual government inefficiency was avoided. Got food stamp, welfare, and war on poverty fraud? 
The Pennsylvania Office of the Inspector General reports the agency prevented $87.6 million in welfare fraud through its investigation of over 25,000 applicants. According to the fiscal year 2014-2015 annual report, OIG prevented $87.6 million in welfare fraud by investigating almost 26,000 applications for benefits. Brought in $22 million in welfare benefit reimbursements through collections, act, collections activities. Filed 833 criminal complaints that charged defendants with welfare fraud for unlawfully obtaining benefits and identified $3.7 million in restitution owed the Commonwealth. Among the listings of significant cases in the report are a recipient who fraudulently received almost over $149,000 in SNAP and medical assistance, as well as a household that fraudulently received over eighty grand in subsidized child care benefits. But it's the rich. It's the rich. Number 45. States recorded some $7.7 billion in improper unemployment insurance payments. We've been here before in 2013. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, estimated improper payments run as high as 18.16% in Nebraska. Louisiana posted the highest es estimated fraud rate in the nation last year at more than 7%. In Wisconsin, Estimated improper payments totaled 92,000 or ni over 92 million through June 30th. A look at some other states: Illinois, 12.2% estimated improper unemployment insurance payment rate totaling an estimated over 266 million. Estimated fraud rate was 1.8%. Michigan, 6.5% improper unemployment insurance payment rate totaling almost 76 million. Fraud rate of 2.25%. Iowa, 10.3% improper unemployment insurance payment rate, totaling almost 45 million. Fraud rate, 1.6%. Minnesota, 4% improper unemployment insurance payment rate, totaling almost 35 million. Fraud rate, 1.9%. Number 46. Who knew the USDA? was also the Department of Transportation and Internet. I described how USDA rural programs fund such activities. We've been around through this before. As local broadband, broadband clam fishing, energy products, apartment construction, and street paving, USDA rural programs will cost federal taxpayers $6.5 billion in 2016. Most of the money will go to the people and businesses that are subsidized, but a portion will end up in the hands of federal bureaucrats. A federal budget appendix shows that there's 5,000 workers in the USDA's Rural Housing Service, Rural Utility Services, and Rural Business Cooperative Service. Based on data in the appendix, they earn an average annual salary of about 73 grand and receive benefits of 25 grand. They earn less than other federal workers, but still far more on average than private sector workers. Fun fact, these 50 rural program administrators earn an average annual, annual salary of 135 grand. All in all, workers in these three rural agencies impose an, impose an annual cost on taxpayers of about 490 million. But these folks need office space, telephones, travel expenses, and supplies to do their paperwork. Based on data in the appendix, that cost is roughly $38,000 per worker for the rural programs, or $190 million a year. Thus, of the $6.5 billion taxpayer cost of the rural programs, roughly $680 million does not get to the broadband companies, the clam fishermen, and street paving contractors. It goes into the pockets of federal middlemen. Why is this important? Because politicians and federal program supporters often talk as if federal funding of local activities is a free boost to the economy, economy, but it is not free for a lot of reasons. Most directly, federal programs are not free because Uncle Sam, the middleman, carves off for itself about 10% of the money flowing through it. We all know, this is number 47, we all know that ethanol and other biofuels have contributed to the overuse of farmland, so-called marginal farmland, 
or marginal cropland. A new study from the University of Wisconsin-Madison researchers show that crops, including the corn and soybeans used for biofuels, expanded onto 7 million acres of new land in the U.S. over a recent four-year period, replacing millions of acres of grasslands. The conversion to corn and soybeans alone, the researchers say, could have emitted as much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as 34 coal-fired power plants operating for one year, the equivalent of 28 million more cars on the road. The study is the first comprehensive analysis of land use change across the U.S. between 2008 and 2012. The researchers said the results may aid policymakers as Congress debates whether to reform or repeal parts of the renewable fuel standard, which requires blending of gasoline with biofuels that are supposed to be grown only on pre-existing cropland in order to minimize land use change and its associated greenhouse gas emissions. For instance, the study found that 3.5 million acres of corn and soybeans grown during this time period was produced on new rather than pre-existing cropland rendering it potentially ineligible for renewable fuel production under the RFS. However, this went undetected due to limitations in current federal monitoring, which captures only national level aggregate land use change rather than the high resolution, resolution changes found in the study. Basically what happened is, as I said at the start, this, uh, the ethanol mandate has caused a lot of farmland that's marginal or basically farmland that's even so bad it's below marginal to be used for crop production. Now we have this. With that said, got Washington pulling everybody in two different directions. The USDA announced it will invest $1.7 billion in 500,000 ranchers and farmers to stop production on sensitive agricultural lands. The investment, part of the voluntary USDA Conservation Reserve Program, will allow producers to protect almost 24 million acres of wetlands, grasslands, and wildlife habitat in 2016. The October 28th announcement said the ranchers and farmers enroll in the program to have access to funding. CRP provides financial assistance to farmers and ranchers who remove environmentally sensitive land from production to be planted with certain grasses, shrubs, and trees that improve water quality, prevent soil erosion, and increase wildlife habitat. And I'm just hitting the high points here. More than 1.3 million acres were newly enrolled into the CRP in fiscal year 2016 using the continuous enrollment authority double the pace of the previous year in fiscal year 2016 fsa also accepted 411,000 acres through its general enrollment authority plus 101,000 acres in the new crp grasslands program only washington could steal taxpayer dollars for an agenda biofuels which is not cleaner or greener causes unsuitable farmland to be utilized for that agenda and then spend taxpayer dollars trying to reverse the consequences of that environmental boondoggle. Well done, ladies. Number 48. In 2005, the private non-profit Hope Academy in coastal Mississippi suffered flooding caused by Hurricane Katrina's storm surge. Hope was eligible for federal public assistance grants to rebuild. However, as the Inspector General for the Department of Homeland Security details in a recent report, with the ta federal taxpayers footing the bill, Hope wanted more. Through unsupported claims, unethical deals, and multiple appeals almost 10 years after Katrina, the taxpayer is out, currently out $2.9 million. FEMA would have paid to mitigate the damages to the Hope Academy and elevate their building. However, Hope claimed rebuilding its original facility would be inadequate for it to serve as 90 students, its K-12 enrollment prior to the storm. Instead of rebuilding its 5,770 square foot building, Hope claimed it now needed a new 13,319 square foot facility. Of course, had the storm not hit, they presumably would have served those students in the old building. Nonetheless, after some back and forth, including appeals to the regional FEMA office, FEMA eventually agreed in 2010 to pay for the larger school which means the taxpayer paid for it. 
Upon gaining approval for a larger school building, Hope then claimed its two-thirds of an acre lot was just too small and asked the taxpayers to pay an additional $1.4 million for a new 16-acre property. The larger facility and the new property were all predicated on an enrollment of 90 students at the time Katrina hit a claim I, the IG questioned and asserted Hope never sufficiently demonstrated. The IG reviewed the physical profile of the old school building and found it wasn't credible that these five separate rooms would be adequate to educate 90 students in 13 different grade levels. Throughout the process, FEMA had apparently taken Hope's word on its enrollment. As part of their investigation, the IG asked Hope to provide some additional proof of its 2005 student population, including student names, tuition, Receipts, tax, fi tax filings, payroll checks, etc. Hope claimed all the records were destroyed in the storm and that the bank no longer kept records from 2005. Hope also said it was not required to file state or federal income tax returns and that it paid its staff as contractor so it did not withhold payroll taxes. What is all the more odd is that one document Hope did provide was a canceled check for tax services, which would seem unnecessary for an entity not filing taxes. As to the student names, Hope could only recall 13 names of its supposed 90 students. Further, one former student from 2005 told the IG they only recalled there being about 40 students at the school. Read the rest of this sordid story yourself, or taxpayers got shafted. They're doing this for the kids, folks, and if you question this taxpayer dollar malfeasance, you hate children, or maybe even you're a racist. Number 49... The federal government spends more than $1 billion each year producing propaganda to promote everything from Obamacare to the post office, but the most significant portion of taxpayer funds used for propaganda goes to the Pentagon. That's according to a new report out from the GAO, which reveals that the Pentagon accounted for a whopping 60% of government public relations spending between 2006 and 2015. Of the 5,000 5,000 public relations professionals employed by the federal government, about 40% work for the Pentagon. There's a Keynesian slush fund for you. The new GAO report is light on details about the Pentagon's specific PR expenditures, but other recent news items provide an idea of where all the PR money goes at home and abroad. Reports last week revealed that the Pentagon paid a British PR firm more than a half a billion dollars to run a prop propaganda program in Iraq. All this Pentagon propaganda could and should be ended. The Department of Commerce also garners a significant portion of PR spending in certain years, too. It would save the taxpayers 600 plus million a year. Read all the gory details, details for yourself. A lot of this advertising and PR are completely unnecessary. Number 50... According to the Inspector General for the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the city and county of Honolulu wasted nearly $10 billion of community development block grant money for no other reason than to just spend federal money fast so they could remain eligible to receive more federal funds. According to the Inspector General, I'm just skipping some of this. I'm not going to read it all. Honolulu's bureaucratic structure led it too perennial, perennially failed a timeliness test every other year. However, in 2013, which means you've got to spend your money, the city was in risk of breaching the two-year rule and possibly losing CDBG money until it cooked up a plan to fast-track some spending. First, the city came up with an alternate process for approving CDBG projects, which, according to IG, had few requirements and was subjective. Then the city put out a brief request for proposals for an acquisition project, high cost in one transaction. They further required the project to move fast, fast enough to prevent the two-year rule from being violated. Ultimately, the city approved a proposal to purchase the Hibiscus Hill Apartments in Waipahu. I'm not going to bother pronouncing that. Hibiscus Hill was not even up for sale, which of course put the owner in a name your price kind of situation. The property ended up selling for about 25% above the appraised value, meaning taxpayers overpaid by about 1.9 million. So you see how they just, they wasted money just to keep money, just so they could spend more. 
I think somebody should maybe lose their job over this and their pension. Why Hibiscus Hill? Good question. The original proposal stated that rent at Hibiscus Hill had increased 40% over the preceding three years, but that claim was not substantiated. However, the appraiser found rents at the apartment complex were at the lower end of the local rental market. Further, since the property acquisition, rents have increased in some cases significantly. This led the IG to conclude, therefore, the acquisition apparently did not serve a meaningful purpose and the city did not support that it was necessary. True, unless the city's real purpose was just to spend money quickly to preserve their grant dollars. The grant recipient's proposal included a promise to spend $1 million of their money in renovating all 80 units in the complex. Yet two years later, only eight units were renovated at a cost of just over $146,000. Further, 50 units were deemed affordable, a promise which the city itself decided in 2015 was unmet. So you see how big government is, and the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, and there's just money getting thrown all over the place and no little or no accountability for it. Now, if this wasn't a federal deal, Hawaii would have wasted their own money, but instead they wasted taxpayer money from taxpayers in 49 other states. Number 51. Waste report readers will remember an addition from earlier this year, Veterans Health Administration, it's not about logistics where we report the VA leaving urology equipment unused for months. We've already been over that. Because the equipment was leased, the VA made over 200,000 payments for the equipment while it sat in storage. Unfortunately, it seems the VA has outdone, its, outdone that waste, this time spending over 300,000 on TVs that have been sitting in storage for nearly three years. The VA Inspector General reports that in 2013, the Detroit VA Medical Center wanted to upgrade TVs and patient rooms. Probably not a bad idea and certainly a benefit to our veterans in a difficult time. Unfortunately, the project included upgrading the whole TV system, which required some amount of construction. Rather than waiting for construction to begin or even be scheduled, the VA saw fit in September 2013 to purchase 300 TVs and accessories immediately at a cost of $311,000. And I'll let you uh, read all the gory details yourself. Basically, these TVs sat and uh, were not used. They didn't need the TVs. And the TVs were even the wrong model. So, uh, yeah, $311,000 down the tubes. Uh, I'll let you read the rest of the gory details for yourself. Number 52. We've been here before. Public employee union abuse of taxpayer dollars for so-called official time. Are you a federal employee and in a union? Well, if you answered no, then you might be surprised to find out that you're paying for union representation for federal employees. According to the Office of Personnel Management, official time broadly, defi broadly defined as part is paid time off from assigned government duties to represent a union or its bargaining unit employees. That is right. Federal employees get paid by the taxpayers to do union work, and according to OPM official time, cost taxpayers $157.2 million in salary and $3.4 million hours not performing government duties in 2012. However, a 2014 report by the GAO questioned OPM's methodology in calculating OT costs, official time costs. GAO indicated that based on a sample of 10 agencies, OPM had undercalculated the cost by 9% on average, which, if true across the board, would put the total figure closer to $171.3 million. Even worse, the GAO stated OPM said reporting on official time is not a priority at this time. Maybe that's why OPM's fiscal year 2012 report on OT is the most recent available. GAO's 2014 report notes that 386 employees were on official time full-time. Two-thirds were attached to the VA. Americans for Limited Government used FOIA requests to estimate that, that number at 490 employees this year. In other words, there are federal employees that perform no government function yet receive full compensation, including federal benefits like health care and retirement. Time off, as OPM says, implies time away. Maybe they're down at the union hall using union equipment. Nope. 
Union contracts negotiated by taxpayer-funded union reps often include non-payroll official time expenses such as travel, office space, equipment, etc. Most agencies and OPM do not generally report these costs. The Social Security Administration, however, does. In fiscal year 2013, non-salary official time cost taxpayers an additional $1.8 million at the SSA. That is just one agency. How did this all come to be? Well, OPM reports that voluntary membership in federal sector unions results in considerable reliance by unions on the volunteer work of bargaining unit employees rather than paid union business agents. Of course, that is not quite true. These are paid union agents, almost 500 work full time for the union, only they are paid by the taxpayers. They are negotiating against rather than with the dues from the members they are representing. So that's a huge scandal. Official time abuse. Number 53, short and sweet, the GAO created 12 fake identities and sought to obtain coverage for those people during the Obamacare healthcare exchange special enrollment period. Ultimately, nine of the 12 fake applications were approved. The applications were submitted to the federal exchange as well as two selected state-based marketplaces in Washington, D.C. and California. The nine applications that were approved were also cleared for advanced premium tax credit subsidies, which averaged about $1,580 per month or $18,960 per year. So you can rep, be sure that there is a ton of taxpayer fraud, a ton of fraud in the Obamacare health care exchanges. Number 54, got Ebola slush funds. In its crusade to tackle the Ebola crisis in Africa, the old Hussein administration violated its own laws by frantically doling out tens of millions of dollars to leftist groups that claimed they could help control the virus from spreading in the continent's western region. Congress dedicated a breathtaking 2.5 billion to deal with Africa's Ebola crisis, but funds came with rules to keep the allocation process in check, and they were repeatedly violated according to a federal audit made public this month. At least $60 million was fraudulently dispersed to non-governmental organizations. Did you get that? At least $60 million was fraudulently dispersed to non-governmental organizations and other efforts without the proper steps to assure the American taxpayer funds we're going to valid groups and causes. U.S. aid was knee-deep in this. Despite the ways so much money was dedicated to the African health crisis that hundreds of millions of dollars were left over. This only became public when the Hussein administration decided to dedicate $510 million of unspent Ebola money to combat the 
Zika virus that struck here at home earlier this year. As if this weren't bad enough, large sums of taxpayer dollars kept going to Africa even after the so-called health crisis was under control as the numbers of new Ebola cases declined. So 60 million down the tubes uh, wasted on the Ebola virus. But who cares? They can print more. Number 55, not quite Edwards' budget law, but close on the Federal Reserve and its overly optimistic economic growth predictions. In short, the Fed has projected faster growth than the economy delivered in 13 of the past 15 years and is on track to do so again this year. So when the Fed describes the labor market as solid, and I've been over this several times in uh, many of my videos, much of the decline, they, they don't, uh, what they don't tell you is the labor force participation rate has taken a nosedive. Much of the decline in the unemployment rate to which Jan Janet Yellen directs our attention has been due to the decline in the labor force participation rate. If people give up on the labor market, they are not counted as unemployed. Far from being a sign of strength, the fall in the unemployment rate for that reason is arguably a sign of weakness in labor markets. Since the unemployment rate is no longer a reliable indicator of labor market conditions, note, at least not the traditional unemployment rate, one must use the U6 and take into account declines in the labor force participation rates, especially men 25 to 54. The so-called unemployment rate should be dropped as a policy gauge, but idiots like Old Fart Rance and McCain and Sirex still autistically repeat it because they're idiots. Number 56. Now, there's a ton of information here. Uh, here's some of the... Uh, the TSA is knee-deep in corruption and fraud. There's been numerous investigations into uh, employee misconduct at the TSA, some of it uh, has to do with security. Some of it has to do with uh, you know, security lapses where a terrorist could conceivably get a bomb on board a plane. Uh, some of it has to do with groping, uh, absent without leave, you know, attendance issues. There's uh, misconduct complaints that the TSA are skyrocketing. They're not going down. And the, and the funny thing is investigations of this misconduct are going down as well. So it appears that uh, the TSA is ignoring and uh, sweeping a lot of problems under the rug, and the GAO has exposed them for this. So, uh, and the TSA, of course, they're all government union goons. Uh, the TSA is so bad, the post office looks good compared to it. Number 57, a cornucopia of examples. There may be some overlap from some of my previous installments concerning foreign aid waste. Again, U.S. aid is featured prominently in their effort to spend American tax dollars overseas on frivolous crap. For example, more than $16 million spent over many years in Macedonia in an effort to turn it into a tourist hotspot. Taxpayers in Idaho expected the benefit is about as much as taxpayers in Montana, slim and none. A cool 100, 450 grand to teach hospital, hospital, uh, hospitality skills to youth in Turkmenistan, including social media training. 177,300 spent by the U.S. Forest Service, US Forest Service to support ecotourism at Lake, Lake Baikal in Russia. About $1 million in Bosnia and Herzegovina for hiking and bike trails. $98 million for tourism support to, wait for it, Jordan. 
Though these people who vote for this crap, who autistically say yay at nearly every spending bill because their pet project is in there, so they ignore the 58 other items like the above, they don't give a damn about the taxpayer. Number 58. Short and sweet on this one. A study of taking selfies and do selfies make you happier. The study released earlier this year found that taking pictures with your smartphone can actually make you happier and in some instances more calm. What probably will make you less happy and calm is that this study was partially funded by a $500,000 National Science Foundation grant, your tax dollars. Selfie waste. Yep, a selfie of waste. Number 59. When Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon in 1969, he uttered certainly some of the most famous words in American history. That's one stall, small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Or did he? Armstrong said that he was misquoting by having an A omitted for, from his statement, claiming it could have been step for a man. Quite the earth-shattering discovery we have on our hands here. Nope, not interested? Don't care? Well, maybe you will care about this. The National Science Foundation helped fund a study. Where National Science Foundation and USAID are just knee-deep in waste. The National Science Foundation helped fund a study which brought together researchers from four major universities to find the missing A. To explain the mystery, researchers even sought out subjects with dialectal, dialectal familiarity to Armstrong, people from Ohio. The study drew on two National Science Foundation grants totaling more than 700 grand. And one of the grants came from the Shovel Ready 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, because that was going to stimulate the economy. Number 60, more foreign aid waste. I'll just hit the high points, including over 170 grand for guinea pig farming in Peru. Here's another one, and no, it's no secret that Haiti is a poor country. According to the World Bank, GDP per capita is just $824. Given these challenges, what better way for the U.S. taxpayer to help the Haitian people than to support an effort to jumpstart a Haitian film industry? In fact, IAF has given eight grants over a five-year period to Foundation Festival Film worth more than half a million dollars. The support began in 2009 with a $257,000 grant to develop the Haitian film industry, create job opportunities, and otherwise stimulate the economy. There's a lot more if you'd like to bang your head against the wall. Again, much of these expenditures are just par for the course as entrenched senators and representatives who have been doing this for decades just keep doing it. They pass along this ability to other fossils when they retire and the cycle keeps going. I can see why Ron and Rand Paul, Ron did and Rand does currently, as well as Justin Amish, and Thomas Massey often vote nay. They see this garbage in there and they care about the taxpayer. Now, this may be a small portion of the budget, but it's, it is exactly this. It's only a little bit mentality that has gotten us on the road to fiscal perdition. Each bit adds up as dozens of polls are getting their pet project or their grant inserted in a spending bill. Likewise, if you contribute $10 a month, more to your 401k, there's my cat looking for attention, for the next 25 years that will add up. This profligate spending must stop. All foreign aid is unconstitutional and I'd wager 90% of it is a complete waste of money. That does absolutely nothing to make America great again. Maybe spending 163 grand on museums in Guatemala will make America great again, but I doubt it. Number 61, have you had enough foreign aid waste? I hope you read all this, and I hope it pisses you off. I apologize for the salty language, but this should make you rocket into orbit. Every senator who cares for the taxpayer should be raising absolute heck on the Senate floor over this. Every representative who cares about the taxpayer should be doing the same, whether Barry O'Boingo or Donald Trump is president. Last December, after years of overruns and more than $100 million over budget, U.S. aid completed and inaugurated, this is uh, the Afghanistan-Gardez-Cost Highway, a 63-mile road connecting 
two cities in eastern Afghanistan near the Ta Pakistan border, part of an American effort to link the rural regions of Afghanistan's central government and Kabul. The highway was funded by American taxpayers at a cost of $233 million or more than $3.6 million per mile. Yet the final total does not capture the full story of the highway's construction, which started in 2008 at an initial budget of $69 million. So we had an initial budget of $69 million, ended up costing $233 million. Keep in mind, Afghanistan lacks the ability to make this road last. In other words, 10 years from now, depending on how many heavy trucks use it, and of course how much rain and scorching heat it's subjected to, 10 years from now, when it needs some potholes filled and maybe some bumps leveled off, it won't be done. Here are some more Afghanistan road blocks. Get it? There's a few more. Uh, I'm not going to read through all those. Uh, we spent a bunch. USAID spent $1 million on a high, highway safety project demonstration in Burma, which uh, I'm sure will just enrich the uh, American economy. Just, yeah, this it's this will drive a person crazy. So uh, here's another one. Uh, USAID and the CDC spent more than $1.7 million on promoting the wearing of helmets for motorcycle passengers in Cambodia. Great investment. Number 62. This focuses on the uh, Rand Paul and a few other senators trying to block a 1.15 billion U.S. sale of 153 Abrams tanks and associated major defense articles to Saudi Arabia. We've spent a lot of money uh, protecting Saudi Arabia. This is a sale of weapons that they will obviously use in Yemen uh, to a regime that is... Uh, doesn't exactly have the greatest human rights record. Why do we continue to assist Saudi Arabia in their involvement of Yemen's civil war? And why do we continue to give weapons to a regime with such a poor human rights record? It would make the Castro regime a Che Guevara blush. This is a mammoth waste of taxpayer cash. Senator Rand Paul is a good man. I just wish he would do as his father did and try to get rid of all foreign aid. Anyways, Rand thought it was a bad idea, and there's a few others that joined to sell arms to homicidal maniacs in Saudi Arabia who persecute homosexuals. That's real persecution. You can end up in dead or in prison persecution, not the persecution in the U.S. where a Christian baker or photographer, photographer says, oh, no, I don't want to photograph your sick union or cater it, or pointing out that a group that is 2 to 4% of the population is half of all HIV infections. That's not persecution. File this away if we have a Rand Paul versus Ted Cruz battle for the GOP nomination in 2020 or 2024 because Ted Cruz voted to block Rand's attempt to circumvent the committee process and bring this to the Senate floor post haste. Roll call votes included. I'm going to ask Senators Joni Ernst and Chuck Grassley why they voted to keep this legislation from bypassing the committee and getting right to the floor. We've given Saudi Arabia a lot of foreign aid over the decades, and uh, it's a waste of money. In fact, all foreign aid is a waste of money. As Doug Bandow at Cato said, I'm paraphrasing, with friends like Saudi Arabia, who needs enemies? So again, is this a good use of taxpayer dollars? Technically, this is a sale, but we, we've, we've assisted them for some time, helping regimes who oppress the opposition and sometimes even execute them. Uh, no. Saudi Arabia is the U.S.'s worst ally. It's no contest. Number 63, more foreign aid follies. Just a few of them. $3.2 million spent on foreign concerts, including 66000 for Herbie Hancock to play a show in Russia. Country music concerts in East Jerusalem. Performances of the Slam and All Body Band at the Body Music Festival in Brazil. 23,744 rap competition to reach out to minority voters in Oslo, Norway, etc. This, this is why we're... I'm just trying to pound it into your heads. If anybody got this far, I'm trying to pound it in your heads. 
Number 64 of 80. The U.S. government's multi-billion dollar, multi dollar effort to counter narcotics here and in Afghanistan is a humiliating failure that's resulted in a huge increase in poppy cultivation and opium production despite the free flow of American tax dollars. To combat the crisis, opium production rose 43% in the Islamic nation to an estimated 4,800 tons and approximately 201,000 hectares of land are under poppy cultivation, representing a 10% increase in one year alone. More than $100 billion have been dedicated to help rebuild Afghanistan, and part of that is the uh, war on opium there. As of December 31st, 2016, the U.S. has spent an astounding $8.5 billion for counter-narcotic efforts in Afghanistan since 2000, 2002. Nonetheless, Afghanistan remains the world's leading producer of opium, providing 80% of the global output over the past decade, despite all our money. Special Inspector General for Afghanistan and Reconstruction writes, the watchdog, this watchdog includes stats from the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, confirming a 10% increase and the amount of Afghan land that was under poppy cultivation between 2015 and 2016. So despite all our money, Afghanistan continues to have a massive opium problem, I guess. But the thing is, the uh, <laughs> those who want to make money there realize that uh, that's where the real money is because there's a lot of people that want it. Um, and there wouldn't be cocaine flowing over our southern border here if there weren't a lot of American idiots that like sniffing cocaine up their nose. Number 65, Senator Rand Paul's war on federal spending waste, foreign aid edition continues. Here are some of the highlights, or er, lowlights. Money well spent. More than $9 million to help ease the medical debt of Cambodia. 177 grand for free health care in Colombian towns to give the Colombian National Police an entry point for interactions with the local peons. 2.9 million to help law students from Afghanistan, including those training in Sharia law. Study law in the U.S. 99,000 to improve, improve cell phone literacy among rural farmers in Kenya including training and in how to get on Facebook with a smartphone. Yeah, I'm sure Kenya, the <laughs> most of the people there, the last thing they're worried about is Facebook. Uh, a lot of it has to deal with growing enough food to survive. $1.9 million to re rehabilitate Jamaica's juvenile criminals through counseling and job placement. More wasted taxpayer money on foreign aid. All foreign aid should be ended immediately. Are you mad yet? Number 66. This will encompass a whole bunch of things. Like I said, there's a lot more. Uh, at my website, I'm not going to go over all this, but a lot of it has to do with uh, government dietary guidelines that they've been shoving down people's throats, officially and unofficially. Unofficially since the 60s, officially since, well, at least the 90s, I found out. The funny thing is, how many decades did they tell us, did they sell us lies on dietary cholesterol? How many decades? So you go to the 2015 2000, through 2020 edition of the government dietary guidelines. And it says a key recommendation from the 2010 guide, dietary guidelines to limit consumption of dietary cholesterol to 300 milligrams per day is not included in the 2015 edition. Oh my gosh. Does that mean those government scientists, the science isn't settled, I guess, is it? <laughs> uh, more research is needed regarding the dose response relationship between dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol levels. Adequate evidence is not available for a quantitative limit for dietary cholesterol specific to the dietary guidelines. Well, what was all that bull crap for 50-plus years? Here's New York Times 1984. 
going ballistic, repeating government talking points. Because the government's always right. The American Heart Association, encouraged by recent proof, recent proof, they should have put that in quotation marks, that lowering high cholesterol can prevent heart attacks. Now, keep in mind, when I'm saying this, I know we'll have some of the autistics come over here. Oh, it's saying you can eat 14 eggs a day. No, retard. I'll get to this. You should have a personal dietary plan. I'll get to that at the very end of this. Lowering high cholesterol can prevent heart attacks. Yesterday, they outlined an aggressive and progressive dietary plan to help Americans lower their blood fat levels. Fewer egg yolks, less animal and dairy fat. That's another thing they told you. Skim milk. Drink nothing but skim milk. And I'll, and I'll admit that I bought into that. So I've been drinking skim milk as long as I can remember. And it's I'm so used to it. I, whole milk tastes like is disgusting. So for what it's worth, but yes, less red meat. You got to be a vegan. No, you don't have to be an autistic vegan. You can eat what you want. Get a personalized dietary plan. And here's Michelle Oboingo's, uh <laughs> the note at the bottom. Hey, parents, get your fat kids away from playing Grand Theft Auto. It's your job, not, not Washington's. The uh, Childhood Obesity Task Force, because the government knows best. And that, that document... I've got it linked to it. Just repeats government. Holy crap, it's like the East German Stasi paying, uh, having paid shills go out and hand out tracts on, uh, on the streets telling everybody what's true because the government says. Here's dietary guidelines for 2005. Choosing foods to limit the intake of cholesterol. There's a warning. This is 2005 and you better limit your cholesterol or you're going to die. Here, consume less than 10% of calories from saturated fatty acids and less than 300 milligrams a day of cholesterol. This was, dang it, it was a fact. It was a fact, dang it. 1995 guidelines. More just repeating to the point of being nauseating warnings about cholesterol. Is the government right? Uh-oh, there's 20 years. More choose a diet low in cholesterol. More repetition, and then we got an article by Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, and I'll go over this really uh, quick. And the big thing, the huge admission. This this admission is so huge it would be like, let me use an example. Progressives will appreciate. It would be like Hitler coming out and admitting and saying the Jews were genetically superior to everyone else. That's how big this is. So. Malcolm Kendrick talking about something that was said by the American uh, American College of Cardiology. Their president said, Some prominent cardiologists have questioned the 2013 guidelines. But the ACC and AHA have shown little appetite to return to LDL targets. And this is the kicker. LDL may or may not, remember the warnings since the 60s, LDL may or may not correlate to cardiovascular outcomes. Dr. Kim Allen Williams, president of the ACC, told Reuters last week. And Malcolm goes over the fact that this was not a slip of the tongue. It was not made by mistake. It's an admission, a tacit admission, that government flapping of the gums on LDL cholesterol over since the 1960s and especially since 1995 that I found in the dietary guidelines numerous warnings it was all bullocks it was bull crap our last little uh, section to go over. Personalized nutrition by prediction of glycemic responses. 
Here, we continuously monitored week-long glucose levels in an 800-person cohort, measured responses to 46,898 meals, and found high variability in the response to identical meals, suggesting that universal, di suggesting that universal dietary recommendations may have limited utility. They validated the predictions in an independent 100-person cohort. And then you got blood sugar levels in response to foods that are highly individual. Indeed, the scientists found that different people responded very differently to both simple and to complex meals. We use that information to develop personal dietary recommendations. Strikingly different responses to identical foods in study participant 445 top Blood sugar levels rose, rose sharply after eating bananas, but not after cookies of the same amount of calories. The opposite occurred in participant 644. So basically, these catch-all, grandiose, sweeping recommendations that the government vomits forth are incorrect because we're all different. Yes, we're all human beings, but we're all different. You know, that's why some people are just predisposed to dying young. Some people get lung cancer and they never smoked. And then there's people that I know who smoked dang near 50 years and still almost made it to 80 when they should have been dead a long time ago due to the way that they wrecked their body. And one thing I'll never say is uh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of drawbacks to smoking cigarettes and cigars. Uh, there's no... But if you want to do it, you can. So anyways... Read the rest of that at my website if you'd like. I just went hit some of the high points. In short, government dietary guidelines have been proven to be BS. And just the mindset of that is BS in and of itself, even if we didn't have this evidence right now that they're uh, hand wringing over LDL cholesterol. Food stamps for junk food, why not? Scroll down to table one, folks. Do you think it's right that 608 million or 9.3% of all SNAP slash food stamp expenditures of taxpayer funded food stamp money went towards sweetened beverages, aka soda slash pop? Hello? Do you think it's right that 138 million or 2.1% of all SNAP expenditures went to items designated as candy? Do you think it right that 6.9% of all SNAP expenditures, 454 million, went to prepared desserts? I know I'm a heartless libertarian who wants all, all poor people to suffer and eat nothing but rice cakes, but what about the taxpayer? Any poll who clings to emotional appeals only mentions the taxpayer as window dressing in an otherwise crummy speech. What about the people who put themselves through school, were responsible, and are now living the high life? I guess they don't count because they can't be used as political human shields in a political argument. What's more, those who utilize SNAP, according to the USD data, spent a higher percentage of those funds on sweetened beverages than the non-SNAP population from this sample. Some food for thought, pun intended. Congratulations, Washington. There's another program that spent a lot of money to help hungry folks and ended up producing obesity. How is it they can be so counterproductive? The folks on food stamps slash SNAP are simply consuming the wrong foods, not too little. So that's uh, yeah, it's, uh, perverse incentives there. No, that was number 70. Number 71, Edwards's budget law and public works projects, namely the Olympics. little background first. Many times NFL owners of NFL and sometimes NBA teams will threaten to move if the taxpayers refuse to foot the bill. In other words, folks who don't give a dang about your stupid team for a new stadium. Shouldn't the owner of the team and or the people who buy tickets and merchandise or the advertisers who hawk their products during games pay for this? Some people think not. Bids for the Summer or Winter Olympics are in the same boat. Idiot politicians want the economic boom and prestige the Olympics brings. Economic boom in quotation marks. But what most folks forget is often those cities spend a lot of money and a lot more than initially projected. Edwards' budget law again to build this and that to accommodate the games, and then it languishes and falls apart. Money well spent. Would you build an elaborate guest house that would be used regularly for a few months and then sit empty for years? No. No intelligent person would do that. So cutting to the chase, uh, Olympic Games are notorious 
And uh, there was an article on the Rio Olympics and how the the Olympic Park there is just a ghost town and it's going to fall down. In 10 years, it'll be a mess. So they spent a bunch of money for what? A couple months of prestige or a month? I didn't watch the Olympics and I don't care. So, but basically, uh, the Olympics are always going to have cost overruns. Well, not necessarily always, but they have. Montreal was a poster child for cost overruns, running a whopping, whopping 796% over budget in 1976, accumulating a deficit that took 30 years to repay. The 1996, in 1996, the Atlanta Games came in 147% over budget. Sydney was 90% over budget in 2000, and the Athens Games cost $12.8 billion, 60% over what the government projected. Bent Fleigberg of Oxford University, the world's leading expert on mega projects, and his co-author, Allison Stewart, found that Olympic Games differ from each other such large projects in two ways. They always exceed their budgets, and the cost overruns are significantly larger than other mega projects. Adjusted for inflation, the average cost overrun for an Olympics is 179%. Mega projects are not the road to prosperity. We went over this earlier in convention centers that uh, mayors like to build. So if you want to put your city in debt for a lot of pomp and circumstance, as well, as well as a lot of time in front of the camera, so folks can see how lovely your city is, and they probably won't be paying off the debt or see how long it takes to, you to do so, then host the Olympics. But it's it's a, it's an economic boom. Yeah, if you don't live there. <laughs> if you leave after it's done. Number 72. Late last year, our embassy in London offered a grant worth as much as, as 75 grand to help bring as many as 10 social media journalists and bloggers to the U.S. to explore American values and cultural issues that shape the American identity and deepen U.K. youth audiences' understanding of the United States in the 21st century. The grant opportunity mentions sending the bloggers to visit cities such as Charleston, Orlando, Dallas, San Francisco, and Chicago to learn about American issues and themes. In other words, a real American experience funded by the U.S. taxpayer. With first-hand experiences in these cities, the bloggers presumably would be better able to convey Americanism to their audience across the pond. All this would make sense if it was 1890 or even 1990, and I still don't think it would make sense, but as the waste report is noted before, thanks to the internet, 24-hour news, and affordable air transportation, our understanding of the UK and theirs the US is not lacking. In fact, nearly 4 million Brits visit the US each year and 1.2 million visit more than one state. These people probably do not need their bloggers' input to have an American experience as, as they have their own, or at least they have a high probability, probability of knowing someone who does. Number 73. This is a uh, Washington Post story. It focuses on the Washington Post wringing their hands over Trump. Donald Trump wanting to cut the Appalachian Regional Commission, which provides subsidies for economic development in selected states. So it's not all 50. And uh, the Post was trying to sow discord in states that voted for Trump because they might get uh, federal money cut. But as I've mentioned many times, what happens when uh, the federal government runs out of money? Oh, they are. Because, you know, if they're taking care of all 50 states, you know, you're going to get to, this is why we're in the uh, situation we're in. The federal funding for ARC, the Appalachian Regional Commission, often goes towards repairing essential services rural towns cannot afford on their own. Or what about the uh, county? or just the state level and no more, such as fixing broken sewer systems. Sewer systems are indeed an essential local service. As such, they should receive a high priority in state and local budgets. If sewers in Appalachia are not being fixed, then state and local governments are failing at a core responsibility. Reporters should ask why that is, rather than demanding that Washington pay for it. The ARC sprinkles about $150 million a year, which is a pittance, Across 13 states from New York to Mississippi, combined state and local spending in those states, excluding federally funded spending, is more than $800 billion a year. So the supposedly crucial ARC spending represents less than two hundredths per, of a percent of the region's own government spending. If the ARC were eliminated, those governments could easily fill the small void with their own money. 
and then drill down to Kentucky. If all ARC money were, money were spent just in Kentucky, it would still only be 0.5% of the roughly $30 billion in state local spending in that state. Why doesn't Kentucky have room in its own budget for infrastructure such as, such as sewers? Looking at census data for state and local governments in Kentucky suggests why. Total capital spending on sewers and solid waste was $234 million in 2014, but spending on public welfare was $8 billion, and spending on government worker salaries was $10 billion. So there's your money. <laughs> Number 74. Got pork? This focuses on the National Endowment for the Arts. And another case of where... Uh, a progressive communist newspaper, the Washington Post, is trying to sow discord in states that voted for Trump because the National Endowment for the Arts is going to, might go down the tubes. National Endowment, and this is focused on Indiana, NEA Indiana projects described by the Post include 3000 for a tunnel made of twisted branches and ten grand for a sound project that they, takes place in multiple spaces and includes a hangout where visitors can listen to records, have coffee or beer, and will eventually include a low-powered FM radio station. Numerous NEA grants seem to trickle through state and local governments before being dispensed to local artists and nonprofits, thus creating jobs for paper pushers along the way. And the story, the NEA is under attack. Oh my gosh, if we don't have the NEA, somebody might die. The NEA's annual budget is $150 million. Indiana has 2% of the U.S. population, so I would guess that it receives about 2% of NEA funding, or $3 million a year. If NEA spending in Indiana is important, couldn't Indiana governments and philanthropists support it? State and local governments in Indiana currently spend $43 billion a year from their own revenue sources. Couldn't they carve out just $3 million, or 0.007%? Seven-thousandths of a percent of that to support local quilters, hoop net makers, puppeteers, and other Indiana crafts people. So in other words, it's unnecessary and there's a, this is why we're 20 trillion in debt. This one I'll go, I have a whole bunch written over on Facebook where I, uh, that an idiot named Jeff Mervis was whining and crying that Jeff Flake and Rand Paul as well uh, raised hell over a uh, taxpayer funded grant called the cheerleader effect. And it was, uh, that's what it was basically on. And it, the phrase came from a popular television series, How I Met Your Mother, in which the main character opines on his dating ex experience. The cheerleader factors when a group of women seems hot, but only as a group, and take each one individually and their sled dogs. So uh, Jeffrey Mervis was, had a hissy fit over uh, Jeff Flake and Rand Paul raising heck over this. And uh, it was it was a complete waste of money. Jeffrey Mervis, uh, little man, if you happen to listen to this, you fund this yourself. So I basically, I went through Jeffrey Mervis's article paragraph by paragraph and point by point and completely debunked it. And I left the link for that and I'll have the screenshots go by. If you want to freeze it and read them all, uh, go ahead. But Jeffrey Mervis is a little, uh, I'll just stop right there. He's a, Jeffrey Mervis, you are a sack of excrement. And that's putting it nicely little man. Number 76. Government ser service contracts are large, complex, and can span years. Because of this, sometimes unallowable expenses, things not covered in the contract, mistakenly get paid by Uncle Sam, which means the taxpayers, if you pay taxes. For this reason, the government employs auditors, such as Defense Contract Audit Agency, to review payments and identify ones that should not have been made. If a payment payment turns out to be improper, the government agency that made it is supposed to recover the money. Unfortunately, according to a recent report from the Inspector General that oversees the IRS, when DCAA notified the IRS of unallowable payments over 10 years, only a minuscule amount was recovered out of over $77 million, and the agency scrutinizing your records was revealed to have less than stellar bookkeeping itself. IG noted the IRS was able, unable to locate any of the 48 contract files associated with its review. For 96% of cases in the IRS database used to track recoveries, critical information was missing. The IRS says it recovered 1.4 million identified by DCAA, but the IG could only find documentation of 545,000, 38% actually being recovered. So obviously we need more government contracts then. So, uh, 
we should make the IRS bigger and hire more people because it being really big now is, is uh, not working, so let's make it even bigger. See, the bigger government gets, the more inefficient it becomes. And again, if you don't pay taxes it prob and voted for Bernie Sanders, it probably doesn't bother you. Number 77, this focuses on a solar project on a golf course. The USDA spent uh, 125000 in rural development grant money last year purchasing solar panels for the Carambola Golf Club on St. Croix. That's right. A golf club, golf, golf club on St. Croix, one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, and it's not a the Carambola golf course. Golf course is itself itself is a center of a larger luxuries luxuries development, which includes a hotel and some one hundred homes, all within an exclusive gated community. Not exactly life on the farm. So you've got people who obviously aren't doing bad. They all they and they got a government loan. They applied for a grant and a government loan guarantee. So these people aren't poor, but yet they're getting grants for solar. One hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for solar, solar panels. It just mind-numbing. They don't care. I mean, anybody who uh, would sign off on anything like this on a Caribbean island, this solar project that should have been paid for by the people that live on the island, no wonder people are angry. This pisses me off. Number 78. Quick, and we'll get through this quick. Auburn University used $130,000 in federal funds from the Economic Development Administration to develop the E-Down a battery-powered down marker that displays numbers from 1 to 4 in LED lights. So, <laughs> apparently, what was the problem? They said uh, mechanical down markers were less visible in lower light, but I'm sure all these stadiums are outfitted with lights that you know work really good. So if you have a night game, or it's really cloudy and raining a lot, I'm sure it's not going to be a problem. Less visible. This isn't the 1940s, you know, when they're playing football in a in a podunk stadium. So they weren't. It was less visible in lower light. Required operators operators to reach above their head, which is incredibly difficult, and just man, and they could jam. So. They spent, again, $130,000 in your federal taxpayer funds. And I'm sorry, this just really irritates me going through this stuff. $130,000 when somebody else, if there was money in it, would have done it. And they've been using mechanical down markers since the dawn of, of football itself. So they don't care. Ever wonder why we have to, this is my note on this, ever wonder why we have to fight like hyenas just to make small cuts in growth? Not actual cuts, but just cuts in growth to the federal budget. None of these pukes gives an inch, and they continue to waste your tax dollars on frivolous items such as this. Absolutely sickening. Number 79. To go, go organic or not. Why are consumers willing to pay almost double for food labeled organic? The average consumer probably believes that the USDA organic label issued by the USDA implies food comes from small local farms that use production techniques that are environmentally friendly and result is in food that is better for human health. The Washington Post published an article recently about an organic farm that does not seem to be consistent with such perceptions. The High Plains Dairy Complex in Colorado, the main facility of Aurora Organic Dairy, has over 15,000 cows. In the organic dairy industry, 80% of the farms have less than 100 cows, but farms with 100 or more cows produce almost half the organic dairy products. The Post article argues that these large dairy operations may be violating the USDA's regulations for organic milk. Though Aurora officials maintain they meet all the requirements for the USDA organic label, the article contends that satellite images, visual inspections by post reporters, and tests of milk from High Plains all indicate that the company may not be complying with the natural grazing standards of the organic regulations. We've got, here's a quote, uh, then Secretary of Agriculture 
Agriculture, Dan Glickman, stated at the release of the final standards for organic foods in 2002, he said, let me be clear about one thing. The organic label is a marketing tool. It is a not, not a statement about food safety, nor is organic a value judgment about nutrition or quality. John Corson and Henry Miller in the spring 2016 issue of Regulation argued that on average organic foods are neither safer nor better for human health than non-organic foods. Eat them if you want, don't eat them if you don't. And the USDA has, USDA has located the National Organic Program and the Department's Agricultural Marketing Service, a service that ex is exempted from environmental analysis because its programs and activities have been found to have no individual or cumulative effect on the human environment. In fact, organic farms may cause more harm to the environment because they require the use of more land and water than conventional farming. Though the touted benefits of organic foods may be non-existent, federal spending on organic agriculture un under the 2014 Farm Act was over $160 million and consumer perceptions of organic food safety and quality persist. As Corson and Miller note, a 2014 Academics Review analysis concluded that because of the USDA organic label, the average, the American taxpayer, excuse me, funded national organic program is playing an ongoing role in misleading consumers into spending billions of dollars in organic purchasing, purchasing decisions based on faults and misleading health, safety, and quality claims. So organic is not all it's cracked up to be. It's not any better for you. It's BS. And But you get to pay for it. But I'm not going to outlaw organic. But it's not, it's not the greatest thing since sliced bread. Number 80... The final one. Got government employees behaving badly? The senior Hussein Obama education department official who has resigned this month to avoid testifying before Congress got hundreds of thousands of dollars in bonuses despite his well-documented failures, sources inside the agency tell Judicial Watch. The extra cash was kept off the books, away from the public, and doesn't appear on his official government salary record but Judicial Watch has obtained the figures with yearly breakdowns. The official, James Runcie, ran the scandal-plagued Federal Student Aid Office, the government's $1.4 trillion financial aid program. It includes, among other things, administering more than $150 billion in loans, grants, and work-study funds to help students pay for college. Under Runcie's leadership, there was pervasive fraud and corruption at the FSA, government sources tell Judicial Watch, including skirting federal rules to hire friends and family and hefty off-the-books cash bonuses despite the FSA's documented transgressions. Just last week, the Education Department Inspector General told Congress that the FSA made an astounding $6 billion in improper payments in 2016 alone as part of the federal student aids programs federal student aid programs the figure includes 2.21 billion in improper pell grant payments and 3.86 billion as part of the direct loan program these are disbursements that either shouldn't have been made went to the wrong recipient or for an incorrect amount or were not properly documented each year the problem gets worse According to Kathleen Tighe, Inspector General for the Education Department, improper payments for the federal direct loan program swelled from $1.28 billion in 2015 to $3.86 billion in 2016, and from $562 million to $2.21 billion for the federal Pell Grant program, all under Runcie's leadership. So obviously we should have the government... Uh, be in charge of, of, you know, completely in charge of all student loans. And uh, as you can see, with the bigger government gets, it is an incredibly inefficient machine, and we need to return to Article 1, Section 8. Congress should do what Congress is only allowed to do, and all, all this other stuff. And this concludes the 80 examples of government waste. Old fart rants, I just, if you made it this far, Gramps, uh, I just disseminate more information in detail. Check my website. It's, I'll leave a link for that under there because it'll be too long for YouTube. I just disseminate more information in this video than you have on your entire channel since you opened it. Have a nice day. And don't thank me now for kicking your rear end.
That was perfect.